so I could enter it, so I could come closer to you, and now I see the fire burning in your eyes, and you tore the veil, so I
You've put your foot down. You've put your foot down. You've put your foot down. We can hear you. promise never leave us or forsake us always be by our side we thank you Lord that you're not withholding any good thing from us and Lord we love you and we thank you for everything that you're going to do this weekend Lord may this be a, a moment in time Lord that we never forget as long as we live we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus name amen amen you may be seated Well, it's good to be back in California. Amen. I know Kevin and Kathy like to come out this way. In fact, it's not on the event calendar because it's definitely not set up yet, but we're trying to go to Carlsbad in spring of next year. <clears throat> yeah, we're trying. No promises, but we're trying. Uh, we're trying to get there. You know how it always is with negotiations with hotels, but uh, pray for us if we're supposed to be, if Kevin and Kathy are supposed to be here in like February, March of next year in Carlsbad, we're going to try to come out. Say amen. <laughs> Let's mute him, please. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen around here. All right, so tomorrow morning, your, the event schedule says 10 a.m. That is not correct. It was correct, but it's going to be at 9 a.m. tomorrow because Kevin's been doing what's called up in the Northeast, they call it coffee talk. It's going to be coffee talk. I, I don't even know if you're allowed to have coffee in here. Anybody go to this church? Can you have coffee in here? Well, I see a lot of people holding up coffee. Either way, either way, be careful. Yes, you can, Walt. I heard Walt's voice somewhere. Anyway, it's coffee talk in the morning. What that is, is Kevin literally goes through these short segments of teaching whatever the Holy Spirit lays on his heart. It could be a multitude of things, so you don't want to miss this because it's like shotgun style. It's like 10 minutes of this, and then he completely does a right turn, and then 10 minutes of this, and it just goes on and on. It's fun. It's, it's, it's a wild ride. So that starts at 9 a.m., so uh, it does say 10 a.m., uh, but 9 a.m. West Coast, so we'd love to see you here for that. Let me give you a few events. Are you here tonight? You're kind of quiet. All right. Let me give you a few events that are coming up here shortly. They're, we're closing out the year. Not this Monday, but next Monday, uh, the team heads to Europe, and we're going to be doing a, an event in Zurich, Switzerland, Cape Town, South Africa, and Germany. So there's still plenty of room for that. For those who are watching online, still plenty of room there. And then we're going to do, in November... Uh, in outreach in Puerto Rico, and we're real excited about that. And then on November 30th, we're going to be in Texarkana, Texas. We're going to do a one-night event there. And then we already have our first event for next year is going to be in St. Petersburg, Florida. So we'd love for you to be a part of that and join us. And uh, Kevin and Kathy, you're not slowing down. And all the staff said amen. Uh, it's wonderful what God's doing. We're, we're uh, you know, with so many lives are getting touched. If it would take us days and days and weeks and months to tell you of all the testimonies of what God is doing through this ministry. 
we see the testimonies come in all the time. One, one recent testimony just came in. It's like, Kevin, I've, I've, I just found you. Where have you been? I just found you. Uh, you know, I'm in love. We're, let's do this. I, I'm listening to everything. I can't listen to fast enough. How many have ever been like that? And we're just, we're just, I'm telling you, things are happening. So speaking of which, make sure you uh, sign up for our YouTube channel. A lot of shorts coming out, a lot of wonderful things coming out on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page. So please sign up and subscribe, be a part of that. We'd love to see you on there. And um, we're so excited. There's so many new things coming out, especially next year. So you want to be a part. And I, we know we don't get to California often because you're kind of far away. Uh, but uh, we love coming out here. We love being with you. And so we thank you for being a part. Amen. Well, we want to receive an offering. Amen. I know, I know that you watch Kevin. How many watch Kevin and Kathy on YouTube or anywhere else? Okay, so if you see me take an offering before, you know how this goes. Even in California, we can say this. If you're not hilariously ready to give, like rolling on the floor laughing that you just can't hardly hold back, I just got to give because I'm so happy. I'm so excited for what God's doing. That's the way to give in the offering, amen? This is a no man manipulation zone, no pressure zone. Uh, even if you don't give, Kevin will come back. And so th this is an offering. See, an offering is unto the Lord. We're giving it to him. And Lord, you use your vessels for what this offering needs to, to be used for. But we give it unto you. We give it to you, Lord. Isn't, that's the way it should be, right? And so, Lord, you take care of it. You take care of that, and you take care of me. You take care of my finances. We're, we believe that everybody should walk in abundant blessing of God. Amen? So thank you for being a part of this offering. You see all the time, because uh, uh, we, we talk about it often, where the offering goes, uh, in so many wonderful things. If you watched it, I believe, a week and a half ago, uh, the, all the one-nighters, uh, Kevin gave uh, the offering to all single moms that week. And did you watch that? I mean, some of them were at our church, they were crying and weeping their life. One lady, I said this the other day, one lady in our church uh, completely made a new turn in her life because of that, because she was totally, didn't, she was done. And so, uh, you know, we, we are called to help single moms and widows and orphans, amen? So anyway, thank you for being a part. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here in California, to be among your, our, our brothers and sisters, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you take this offering and, Lord, that you use it for your glory, to advance the kingdom. And, Lord, anybody here, anybody in the sound of my voice that's suffering financially, Lord, I pray that you bring sweet relief, Lord, quickly. And I thank you, Lord, that you're turning everybody's finances around, Lord, in this day. Lord, we bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Chris. Well, I don't know if you heard, but our God is a consuming fire. Amen. And he is calling us to be on fire for him as well. He is calling us to be his burning ones. Is there any burning ones in this room tonight? All right. I see your hand. It's like a little flame right now. Listen, God wants to set you on fire so people come and see and watch you burn for him. Amen. All right. You guys need to calm down. You're getting a little excited here. Listen, we are so excited to be here, and you already heard about the theme, the fire of God, and I want to tell you about something that is so hot right now and hot off the press. This book, three-volume set, is Holy Fire, and I want to tell you, I don't want you to purchase this unless you're ready to go the next step and the next move of God. Amen? This book is so hot. Listen, I don't know if you know the backstory of this, but it was going to be one book, and Kevin was working on it, and the devil fought him for seven years for this one book. And he said, you know what? I'm going to flip it on the devil. So I'm going to make a three-volume set. So now we have a three-volume set, and I want to tell you, yeah, you could clap. That's, that's awesome. It's a three-volume set. The first book is called In His Image. And I want to tell you, I got this when it first came out, and I just got through the first book because it is so hot, so fiery. You read a couple pages, you get on your face, you pray, you repent. Lord, forgive me how I've been, I've been thinking the wrong way and set me on fire for you. The second book is called A Friend of God. And I just started this one. 
And I want to tell you, it's all about the love of God. It's all about the love of the Father. And it's talking about the next move of God, which is going to be about the love of the Father. Listen, there's been so many moves of God, and they've always been, you know, different things. But this next move is going to be the love of the Father. And listen, we've got to understand this. We've got to get this because the prodigals are coming home in Jesus' name. Your family, yeah, you can clap. I'm trying to be still. I see the camera going back. Okay trying to come down here. All right. And this third book is the kingdom of God, which I have not started, but I want to tell you, I know it's going to be really good. And we have these available. So if you go out the sanctuary and you take the first, you go out this little entrance, right? And you take the first left. We have a bunch of these still available. We have music, we have CDs, all kind of stuff, good stuff. And I want to also tell you what's going on tomorrow morning at 830. It's always on Kevin and Kathy's heart to come into a city and always uh, give to that city and help that city. So tomorrow morning, for those that you want to help us, uh, right out this door to the right, we're going to package up 150 bags of food for the homeless and for, uh, you know, single moms, single dads. If you're a veteran in this place, this is for you first. And then, you know, we're going to give it out as well. We also have diapers. We have, how many knows that diapers are expensive? All right. So we have diapers and we have wipes. Isn't that awesome? You can come to church, you get fired up, and then also get groceries. So if you know somebody, or maybe yourself, that you need them, or you have a neighbor, you have a coworker, that you know, you know what? I know they could use some groceries. Listen, these groceries are a, a contact point, right? It is, you grab this bag, and you go and you give it to someone, and they say, why are you doing this? And you say, I'm glad you asked, because Jesus Christ loves you, has a plan for your life. And I know you may be going through a tough time, but God loves you. And there's books written in heaven that you need to fulfill. There is a bookcase in heaven with your name on it and a book with your name on it. And he wants you to grab that. And there's pages and pages that God wants you to fulfill. So if you want to help me tomorrow morning, right out this door to the right, we're going to do that. And uh, we're going to package those up and we're going to give those out. Amen. Also, I want to tell you some of the things that we do at our church. And I saw so much traffic here. I want to tell you, this is an awesome church, but it is an awesome place for evangelism. I want to tell you what we do at our church. And I want to tell you, if you're not already doing it here, you can do it here at this church. And it works. It's amazing. Because the atmosphere here is filled with signs, miracles, and wonders. I can feel it. So at our church, we hold up signs that say free hot dogs, free cotton candy, free popcorn, need prayer, Jesus loves you, free money. And these people, listen, there's so much traffic out here. I challenge you to take some signs, not in the street, but right on the side. Like this, as the traffic is coming, you hold a sign. And I wanna tell you, there will be so many people that come into this church that will come by and you just share the love of God, right? So what we do at our church, we hold up these signs and every, every other Saturday when we do this, we have so many people. It's every time we do it, there's all these different groups of people, right? This one lady came in driving this brand new Maserati. She got out of her car, all decked out, looked nice, all this gold. And she said, hey, listen, I don't need money. I don't need groceries, but I need prayer. Can you imagine that? The Bible says you can have the whole, you know, you can have everything, but still forfeit your soul. So she said, you know, I just need prayer. So we pray with her. She began to weep. She began to cry. She goes, thank you for what you guys are doing. Listen, we've given out groceries. We've had people say, if, you, if I did not drive by here today, I would not have been able to make it this week. But because you guys are giving out, I can make it this week. I could feed my kids. I, we've had stories where people are said, you know, I only had $40. It was either groceries or gas. But now I have groceries and now I can have gas to take my kids to school. Isn't that amazing? Yes. So I want to challenge you, just like Kevin and Kathy says, we are doing this together, all right? We can do this together. If we hold up signs, another thing we do at our church, on Friday nights, we, uh, we take hot dogs, and we put chili in them, and we wrap them up in tinfoil. We put them in little uh, coolers, and then we put them in these, these, uh, these little carts, and we just roll around the city, right? Just imagine, right? You got all these coolers, right? And you have this little buggy, and you're just pulling it around, and people are like, what is going on, right? Just a crowd of people. You're pulling these and people come up and they'll say, what are you doing? Listen, we're just sharing the love of God. And we go to an area where there's a lot of homeless people. The people come up and listen, we've had people say, I am so glad you're out here tonight. If you wouldn't have been out here tonight, I wouldn't have been able to eat, right? We also make homeless bags. 
We call them homeless bags. In these homeless bags, these, these big freezer size Ziploc bags. Inside there, we put water. We put tuna fish. We put, um, you know, uh, little notes that say, Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life. You could put tracks in there. You could put, you are valued, you are loved. And this is what I want you to imagine, right? You have a homeless person at the stoplight all day. They, people have been cursing at them, saying, get a job, you bum, all this nasty stuff, right? You stop at the stoplight. You have this homeless bag. You grab this homeless bag. You give it to them. And you say, listen, I know you're going through a tough time, but Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life. You drive off, they open this up. There's, you know, water and then there's tuna fish, there's crackers, all this stuff. And there's a note in there that says, you are valued, you are loved. Isn't that amazing? Listen, we can all do this. And I want to tell you, the kids are getting it. The kids are writing little scriptures on rocks. We are telling the kids to take rocks, put scriptures on there, say, Jesus loves you. You could take rocks, you could paint them. You could put them at, at the bottom of people's mailbox. So when they go out and check their mail and they're like, God, if you're real, you know, send me a check in the mail. If you're real, speak to me. And they go to their mailbox, right? And they look down and there's a rock that says, Jesus loves you. All right. So, and that, God's speaking to you, right? All right. So listen, I just want to encourage you. I know I'm being long here, but I just want to encourage you. We can all do something. Amen. You can give up water. You can do prayer. So tomorrow, if you want to join us, tomorrow morning, 830, right through those doors to the right. Pastor Mike. All right. Praise God. Well, how many of you are tired of going through the mess that you've been going through and you're ready to see your life be transformed? If, if you're not, then maybe, you know, maybe you need to be a little more honest with yourself. We'll talk about that later. But this weekend is here for impartation. And many of you have been going through so much and you've been facing through so, facing so much. And listen, this weekend is dedicated to breakthrough to overthrow. And many people have been living through going from breakthrough to breakthrough. But what about, let's just overthrow it. Let's take all that stuff that's been trying to follow you and harass you. And let's, let's, let's really trample and tread on it this time. Okay? So I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know what's been going on in your life. But this weekend is dedicated to getting you into overthrow and for you to live in a brand new place. Because Jesus died for you to walk in the fulfillment. Okay? Not half, but fulfillment. The full measure. Okay? So how many of you got your study guides? Got free study guides? You got your CDs. All right? So you can thank um, Kevin and Kathy and you can thank a partner for that. And so thank you to all the partners that are here and that are online. We just, we're so thankful because listen, the, the key to Acts and the power of the Holy Spirit coming was they were in what? One accord. It's unity. And there is the reason why you face the enemy and division so much in your life. It's about unity. And that's what Warrior Notes is doing. That's Kevin and Kathy's heart, is that we come together as the body and the bride. And when the bride comes together in her full glory, I guarantee you the bridegroom's coming on a horse because he ain't gonna be able to handle it no more. So we gotta get ourselves ready, right? Okay, so partners, thank you for making this weekend happen. Thank you for everything you do. You know, this morning, I don't know if you got to see, but we had a bunch of kids come out and Kevin and um, Captain Chris got to put on an air show for the kids, taught them about aviation. But more importantly, aviation's good, but what's more important is their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so everything they were doing was talking about value, their destiny, and their purpose. And so we already kicked off the spirit school, and it's been amazing with the kids. So we're so excited for what's about to happen. And don't forget, tomorrow we're going to have a session for the kids at 11 o'clock. We've got a full day tomorrow. And if you're new to Warrior Notes, just put your seatbelt on, get a, ga a gallon of water, and a couple snacks, because we're going for it, Okay but it's gonna be amazing. Now I heard that there are some Warrior Notes School Ministry students here. Do we have some students here? That was your opportunity, by the way. Okay, and do we have any alumni here? If I have any alumni, would you stand up real quick? Let's give these guys a hand. All right. Good job. Pastor Simmons is gonna stay seated. I wanna just tell you this. 
If you have not been introduced to Warrior Notes School of Ministry, you've been missing out on the greatest thing, one of the most powerful things that's happening in our generation. And I say that not because of numbers or not because of Warrior Notes in itself. It's because people are finding that they have a destiny on their life and they can be equipped. So many times we go through things and we don't make it through it because we were not equipped. The people that are equipped are the ones that go all the way. Does that make sense? You guys okay? You're staring at me a little crazy. Okay. We've got to get equipped. We've got to know our tools and our resources. If we don't know our tools and our resources, then we get into battle and we get taken out. But it's time for that stuff to stop. It's time for no more believers, no more brothers and sisters in Christ to be taken out. We need everybody in the battle. We need everybody in the battle. So if you're here today, and I just really feel this in my heart, if you've been beat up, if you've been going through the battle, if the battle and the war has been getting inside of you, this weekend is so you can pour all that out and let Jesus pour his love and his healing inside of you. All right? But then you got to go further. You've got to go further. You can't just stop there. And I want you to connect with us. I want you to connect with Kevin and Kathy because we've got courses that will literally shift your mindset and shift all the things. The, how about some bad doctrine and some bad theology, maybe some sacred cows that maybe need to be shot. We need to get them out of us, right? So we can go farther. And Kevin has poured out his heart in these courses. And so this weekend is gonna be the IV bag. It's gonna be the shot. It's gonna be the paddles. And it's gonna fire you up. But you can't live from IV to IV. You gotta live in a more sustainable place. And so I really wanted to take a moment and plug this because our graduates, listen, for all the grads that stood, if you have questions, go talk to them and you will be shocked. We've got grandmas in their 80s that are graduate. We've got teenagers. We've got everybody. I've got doctors. We've got lawyers. You name it. They're not after the paper. The degree is great. We are fully accredited. The degree is great, but the impartation and the transformation is everything, and the church has been sold short, and so I want you to know that there is the real deal gospel, real, guild, real deal teaching, and real deal equipping. So connect with us. We've got scholarships, no matter your age or where you're at in life. If you're a mom taking care of your babies, if you're military, if you're a first responder, if you're a teacher, if you're a plumber, if you're just trying to figure it out. Kevin and Kathy have made it where there are courses that can be scholarship to you to invest in you. Because listen, so many people have taken from you. It's time that you let Jesus invest in you. And it's time to become good receivers. How many want to become good receivers this weekend? All right, well, let's do it. All right? So now I'd like to have one of the coolest pastors in all of Texas. I hope you Californians can handle him. But God called this man, Kevin and Kathy, um, had felt in their heart this was the right man and right woman, him and his wife, and they've absolutely come on and been an amazing help. With our last graduation, we have almost 500 alumni already, and we're expecting somewhere between 570, 750 additional alumni in 2024 because we're at almost 37,000 students. So we needed a man and a woman, God, that have been uh, a part of raising up churches, raising up leaders to support the alumni everywhere they're at. And that is Pastor Simmons. Let's give it up for him. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. It's good to be in Santa Maria. We love California, love the coast, love the water. Um, we've been here many times visiting through, brought my kids always to, to Disneyland and stuff. But I'm telling you, I've never been here with the power of the Holy Spirit moving. And it's just exciting to be here and be a part of what Jesus is doing right now. I'm gonna just give you a, a really quick testimony, and that is this. 40 years ago, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and it changed my life forever. It lit me up like you can't believe. And my wife was like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You're going nuts. What's this tongue stuff? What's going on? But I'm just telling you, I got a hold of Jesus, and it was like a live wire. And it set me on fire. 
And I'm telling you, and this, I'm, I'm, I know I'm dating myself, but this is all back in the 80s and early 90s. I just blew it as fast as I could go. You know what happened? Partway through the 90s, it's like everything began to fizzle. And I didn't understand what was happening because, you know, it, it was the move of the Spirit. It was the move of God. It was the, the Word of Faith movement was really moving strong in there. I'm a graduate from Rama. And I'm just telling you, uh, it was going and going and going, but God had different plans. And we had to make some adjustments. And I saw the Spirit of God pull back from some things because we had gotten off base. And uh, just in some of the messaging that we are doing, I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm a five-fold minister, I'm a pastor, but I'm just going to tell you this, we sold the body of Christ short. We as fivefold ministers, we were doing the best we could. We were doing what we, we understood we needed to do. But I'm telling you, we, uh, we got off track. And so God had to do some rearranging. And he brought along Dr. Kevin and this Kathy. He never, he never leaves a generation without a voice. And we have someone and some ones who have connected to Jesus. How many of you have heard his testimony? How many of you have read his books? I am telling you, when he talks about Jesus and seeing Jesus face to face, I'm just telling you, it makes you melt. The power of God is so sweet and so strong and so filled with fire. So we at Warrior Notes Ministries, we want to help you catch on fire and then keep the fire. We want to keep you moving in the right direction. That's our heart. That's all it is. We want to keep you moving in the right direction. For us to keep you moving in the right direction, we have to keep moving in the right direction. Is that correct? We have to keep an open ear to the things of the Spirit. Dr. Kevin and Dr. Kathy, they cannot do this without you. Did you know Jesus can't do this without you? He needs you. He needs you to stay connected. He needs you to stay with the body of Christ. You do understand that the unity of faith doesn't mean we compromise what we believe. Right? Unity means we got one purpose, and that's on fire for Jesus. And we're working together to see this generation know the real Jesus. No fake. We don't need any fake anymore. Just one more little quick thing. When I started growing, going gray 30 years ago, I wanted to dye my hair, and my wife would not let me. You know why? She said, we don't like the fake. And I said, but babe, she's not in here, is she? I said, but you put dye in your hair. She said, that's different. <laughs> she said, it doesn't look right on men. I'm like, okay, okay. Well, I will tell you this honest to God truth. This ministry does not like fake Christianity. We want it real. So as director of alumni, I'm just here on the team to help you stay connected, to help you do whatever you need to do, to take this to the next level, to get in your warrior fellowships, to do the things that Jesus has anointed you to do. Can you say this with me? I am anointed. I am anointed. Say it again. I am anointed. Say it with me one more time. I am anointed. Say this with me. Of God by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> okay, that was good enough, so we're going to close. No, I, I'm blasted. Wow. I mean, I got most of my staff as pastors. It's amazing. Anyway, um, I wanted to honor... Um, uh, my, one of my pilots, he's uh, the one that flew the fighter jet here with me. Uh, Chris, you want to come up here? He, I want him to share a little bit. And um, I also, Chris is a Marine. 
and um, he's retired. <laughs> Amen. And he uh, he he uh, he is a strong believer. He he flew F-18s off of uh, aircraft carriers. Been was in the Gulf War, and he's got an amazing testimony. And I asked him to share a little bit tonight. And also, Chris, I just want to honor you. You've been such a help to me. This guy has taught me how to fly a fighter jet, and now I'm a captain. And I just want to honor you with what he said. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. (laughs) Thank you. He wants to share. I've asked him to share a little bit about um, some of the training he went through and that we go through. And um, it's a, a huge story of how we met and how God worked this out for the kids program and things like that. So go ahead, Chris, and talk to, to them about your training and everything. And uh, I'm going to go over here and get blasted. <laughs> sure. Thank you. <laughs> oh. I got to turn this thing on. Check. Check. There we go. I just got to speak. Okay. It's great to be back in the land of fruit and nuts. Right? I spent seven years in California down in Miramar, San Diego, and SoCal, as you all know, is a lot fruitier and a lot nuttier than Santa Maria, I'm sure. But uh, seven years there, we were just in Texas a couple days ago, and I, had, I lived in, in Texas for seven years as well. Um, but it's, it's such a privilege to be here with the whole Warrior Knows team. Thank you for the books so much. I'll be digging into those for sure. But we had an event at the airport today, like, like Kevin mentioned. How many of the kids are here that were there at the airport? You see some hands? You guys can make noise in church right now if you want to. Kids over here. Where's my Idaho? Idaho crew? Idaho neighbors? It was, uh, it was so beautiful. We started talking to the kids on the, uh, on the parking ramp with the jets. Kevin did a walk around of the, uh, of the warrior jet, and then we did our little uh, training jet. And it was gray and cloudy, and then the clouds started to part, perfect timing. And next thing we knew, it was sunny, beautiful. We got to go flying. How many passes did we do over you guys, kids? Did anybody count? It was almost countless. It was so many. But we got to fly. It was a great time. We talked to the kids. We wanted to make sure they understood that aviation and the human creative spirit that God gives us to make airplanes is worthless without the human in that cockpit to do the work, to maintain the airplane, to build it, to fly it, and that's a reflection of God's value for the kids and really a reflection of God's value for all of us with, uh, with, with that particular example. So Kevin asked me to apply some of the aviation things we did, the pilot stuff that we did and do to ministry, to life, <clears throat> to testimonies. So with the kids, we talked about the importance of personal integrity, the integration of virtues, and kids... Remember what we talked about, the three things? Discipline, which is doing the right thing even when nobody's watching and nobody's telling you to do it. We talked about initiative, seeing what needs to be done and doing it. And we talked about humility, counting others uh, more significant than yourselves, just like Paul says in in, uh, Philippians 2. So with that foundation of personal integrity, that integration of those virtues and others, It puts you in a good position to talk about what we're talking about tonight, which is then going out and creating value, uncommon value for the kingdom. Because if you're a person of integrity, others will trust you. They they will trust you. You will trust them. And trust is the foundation, the core of any team. And so when you come together as a team in aviation, we need to align three things for to have a high achievement kind of a mindset. We call it the victory mindset. We're more than conquerors, right, in Christ. So we have a victory mindset of doing the right thing and uh, and creating value. The first component, I'll tell you all three, it's vision. The second one is accountability. And the third one is normalizing excellence. So when we went out flying today, Kevin had a vision, and I was there to support him and his vision and the Warrior Notes team's vision of having an event that shows kids that value, gives them the opportunity to understand what it takes to be a pilot and to succeed in life, and our strategy, our mission to do that, what we were doing was flying the airplane and and, and engaging the kids and their families. Kids, how did we do? Okay? You guys have a good time today? So we had a vision, and I submitted myself for that team vision Kevin and every team member submitted themselves. And that's what you do as a team. You submit your vision to the team's vision. So we did that in aviation. And if you think about it as believers, where's the, t- the camera anyway? Am I supposed to be standing over here? No, I'm good. Oh, you're right there. <clears throat> um, as believers, we have a vision for the church. So you can think about it biblically and consider some verses that we have. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That'd be a good one to consider. 
But that's kind of what we do, right? We love the Lord our God and we love our neighbor. We have the Great Commission, which is a mission to go and make disciples of all nations. But again, that's what we're doing on a daily basis. Your mission is are the things or the thing you do to get to vision. The vision is your preferable future, your goal. And so as believers, I've heard it defined that Westminster Catechism said our, our purpose, the whole purpose of mankind is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. And the missions, the great commission and loving the Lord our God and loving our neighbor as ourselves, that's our mission to do to get to that point of glorifying him and enjoying him forever. I've also heard it said, we need to know God and make him known. So as believers, the church, that's our vision. We all unify, are unified behind that vision. So first component of an achiever mindset, a victory mindset is vision and submitting yourself to the team's vision. The second component is accountability and not just accountability where you're going to get smacked upside the head if you do something wrong, but willing accountability. When Kevin and I went flying, me in a supporting role with him, I needed to submit myself to being held willingly accountable for things that he needed me to do or things that I maybe didn't do. We briefed the flight, we go fly the flight, and then we debrief the flight. And like he said today, sometimes we spend an hour talking about what we did for 30 minutes in the airplane. So I submit to that for willingly to be held accountable. Kevin does as well. We debrief, we talk about things. One of the hardest things for humans to do is to be willing to be held accountable. Why is that? It's in nature, right? It's a fallen world and I'm a fallen human. And it took me until age 38 when the Lord allowed storms that I had caused to come into my life to make me look to the cross finally to know that I was a sinner in need of a savior and be saved by his grace and not just me, but my wife simultaneously. So age 38, finally, I repented and believed in the gospel just like Jesus is recorded as saying in the first chapter of, of Mark. Repentance is being willingly held accountable. That's the first step. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so that's not just a one-time deal though, right? I still have sin that dwells in me. I'm free from, free from the condemnation of sin, but not the presence of sin as long as I'm in this body, in this fallen world. So repentance, accountability, willing accountability is a daily process for all of us. Vision, willing accountability. The third thing, once you're finally to the point of being willing to be held accountable, now you can work towards excellence because accountability drives results. And it's the results that gets you working towards excellence. In the airplane, Kevin, whenever he's flying that thing, and I'm just back there kind of hanging out, not doing much because he's so highly trained now, if he's looking on altitude, working on an altitude, he is on altitude. If he's at 5,003 feet, he's trying to get back to 5,000 feet. If he's landing on the center line and he deviates a little bit, he's working to get back to the center line. Constantly pursuing perfection, which again, as humans, that's just a target, right? We're never going to get there. But if you're pursuing perfection, you're going to arrive at excellence. And excellence as a habit means you're normalizing that pattern of excellence. So we can do that in the airplane. You can do that in your job, in your family, in school, in sports, in everything to create uncommon value on a day-by-day -day basis. Not just for yourself, but you're serving others, you're serving the kingdom, and you're pursuing that ultimate vision of glorifying God and enjoying him forever. And aviation is a great way to look at that and apply it. Like in our company, Victory Flight Training, we talk about making every day a victory in big ways and small, in flying, but also in your work, your family, and your life overall. Kids, you can do it every day. You can get out of bed, make your bed without mom and dad telling you, and start the day with a small victory. Small victories add up to big victories. It might not be the Super Bowl, but you can make every day a victory. And that's what we're charged to do for the kingdom. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right. Well, there's the intros. So um, the Lord asked me to uh, go over something that I guess people don't understand anymore. So um, Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head have, have offered to travel with us for the next year. 
and you're going to hear this every session, but Mr. Potato Head, he's really, he's comfortable with who he is. He has pronouns like he and him, and uh, he's a hot potato. It's another pronoun. High testosterone level, everything's good here. Lots of hair. And um, he met Mrs. Potato Head, and Mrs. Potato Head was a hot potato. So Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head got married, and the result is a tater tot. Is there any questions? This is all in Genesis chapter 1. And, and these probably are Idaho potatoes here. They're Idaho. All right. So this is how it starts out, and this is how it ends. What happens in between, um, you know, I, I don't want, I don't want to have, be the one to judge uh, people for this. Thank God I'm not God. And, um, but I, I want to tell you that it, it has always been the womb of a woman that man has come from, except for the first man. The woman came from the man. But then after that, it was always the womb. And that's why they're called womb man. <laughs> it's pretty simple, you know. And, um, and uh, Jesus came from a womb. And um, Mary carried Jesus for, for nine months. And she was a woman and she carried the Son of God. Even though she can't preach in America or have a church or anything, she, she can carry the Son of God. Isn't that something? And all the women that followed Jesus around says that they gave unto Jesus' ministry. So uh, you, they'll take the woman's money. So all you women out there, you're so important. And um, you're called of God and you're anointed of God. And you can preach the gospel too just as much. And if, you can, if, you, if, uh, a, if your womb can produce life, why can't you preach life? Boy, that was not what I was looking for. <laughs> So, so God trusts us, right? He trusts us to, to be who we are and, and to seek that the equilibrium in the spirit, not in the world system or by pressure, or by uh, all the demonic stuff that's going on. We got to seek our equilibrium and who we are, even our pronouns. We got to seek them from the spirit of God and stay in the norm, in the, to stay in the green zone, you know? And um, the Holy Spirit will bear witness with you in your spirit. And that's, that's how you live. And it's just that it hasn't been emphasized enough in the church in, in, in the past years, obviously. If it was, we would have passed all our tests and, and, and a lot of things would have been different. But see, now we have to reconcile. We have to be held accountable and we have to go from breakthrough to overthrow. We can't just be in breakthrough because then you need another breakthrough. And you all know what happens. This happens to me every Thanksgiving. I get up out of, off that table and I tell the Lord, I will never eat again. Now I'm so full, I would never eat again. And then by, by 8 o'clock at night, I'm saying, hey, where's the leftovers? And that's just the way we are with everything. We think, we think a certain way and then something will happen and then we realize we just, we really aren't, um, we aren't really right about our perceptions about things. So we have to be able to deal with hardship as a good soldier. You know, that's in the Bible still. And there's a lot of scriptures for the last, since I've been a Christian, this will be uh, this, just in a week, uh, in a week on October 6th, it'll be um, 43 years. Uh, 44, 44. 44 years as a Christian, and um, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, thing with me is, is learning to be disciplined and be accountable, uh, and, and also to, to say, listen, if I'm lost or if I'm wrong, to get it right, right away, just, just uh, make it right with God, make it right with people, and stay right on, on, on the line of what God has called you to do. Don't veer off just because of pressure. This is what I've learned walking with God is, is that what he needs us to do is be established in, in who we are by the word of God and by the spirit 
uh, witnessing to it. And then staying the course no matter what. So, so if, if Jesus suffered and died for certain things that are not believed upon anymore, it doesn't diminish what he did, but it does diminish the manifestation of it. The result of it has to come through faith. The manifestation has to come through into this realm. It has to explode into this realm, and devils have to fly away. They have to be thrown away. Sickness has to go, and even poverty. Everything has to go. I mean, according to the way Jesus preached, if, if what he accomplished on the cross was all these things, which it is, the gospel, the good news, then it can never, it never diminishes on what he did, but it could diminish through the lack of the message being preached with its full force. So I would never want to stand before the Lord and not have given it my all, which means that even if no one gets healed, I still believe in healing, yeah. right? If I, even though people um, can't pay their bills, I still have to believe that God is my father and your father and that he's a good God and he's gonna provide for you because, because uh, you gave him your life and you gave him your finances and you've been, you've been faithful. Okay, you have to stand on that. This is what's happening in the last days. It, it's the, there's a fight to diminish truth or to have you to question it. But manifestation doesn't come first. Believing comes first. So you have to know the truth. So, so I was telling the kids this morning, you know, when I counted up the pages just off of the, the Phenom 300 jet, the, I, I think it was over 7,000 pages I had to, had to know. It was like nine manuals. And the first day when I started training, like a year later, it still felt like the first day, a whole year. And then there came a point where, where something inside of me said, you know what, you're going to have to know this stuff anyway because, you, you know, this is good, not going to go away. So I had to face the fact, I'm going to be accountable and I'm just going to know this. So every page I read, every class I took, every flight I took, I, I just resolved the fact that even though this is painful, this is like, I feel like I'm not, I'm not up to speed with anything. I feel like I'm so far behind. It went on and on and on, I went back for retraining and it was even hard after a year. Then something happened to me when I started to say, you know what, these pages are not gonna go away. I might as well, this is, this is, this is, a, this is what I'm gonna be doing the rest of my life. Then I'm going to say, you know what, I'm not gonna resist learning anymore. And I'm not gonna say, well, I don't need that page. and I don't need that. When is that gonna ever? I started not throwing away anything anymore when I would read it. And this is what happened to me. I just, I just got out of Dallas to get my airline transport license to, to, to fly for airlines, but I don't want to because I think we can do it better. But in order to, to get this rating, it's just, it's just like, a, it was a, I had to memorize 1,655 questions and I didn't know which 125 they were gonna ask me. And I had to study, study, study. But you know what they did for the first four days? It was like almost two weeks. For four days in a row, eight hours a day, I watched films of crashes and mistakes. And after the end of that, I mean, a whole class was like, they were, they, they were like, well, what are we, what's, what's this? And I was like watching everything. I was listening to everything the pilots were saying. I was watching what they forgot. I was watching the burning hole and people crying because they lost their loved ones. And it was all because most of the time, I mean, you wouldn't believe it, but most of the time it could have been prevented, 90%. And no pilot's gonna admit that in public, but I'm telling you, it was all preventable. And it was all based, when they went back, they went back, the NTSB went back, they went through the pilot's training every year, every pilot that they went through and they said, oh, he had trouble with this. Next year, had trouble with this. Same thing. Why do you have recurrent training? 
is so that you don't have recurrent problems. <laughs> so at what point does it stop? The, f- the failure, the disconnects, like where you feel like you don't connect, where, where you know what God has told you, you've had prophecies, you've had non-prophecies, <laughs> you've had, you have, you know, you, you've had all these things happen and you're, you're, you're supposed to take all this information and try to assess, but you're not supposed to determine your value by words given to you or by what happens to you or doesn't happen to you. What you do for a living, it doesn't necessarily define you. It might not be your gifting. It might just be because it's six figures or seven figures. Because a lot of times people just chase money. And it's, it's the incentive, right? And the benefits of that. But how many people really are using their gifts at their job? I believe that Satan does this to uh, get people off. And he, and he pays... So you want to be a basketball player because you get eight figures. But a teacher gets, you know, five or six, you know, a teacher. There's no incentive. Do you you hear what I'm saying? Okay, so I'm thinking about if I want to excel, I got to accept the fact that I got to know the manuals. If I want to go to where I don't have repetitive mistakes, I got to get to a place where it becomes normal for me to respond according to what is written. So you know where I'm going now. Okay, so if you want to be the best at something, you have to gather all the information that's available about that and you study it and you, you own it. You, you, that's what the message is tonight. It's called own it. What happens is, is most people... When you talk to them, um, they, they have di- everybody has a different reason. Not everybody has the same reason for coming to Christ. And it's all situational. Um, th- some of it, you don't even know what you know now, but you still became a Christian. So you didn't know everything, but you became a Christian because you repented and you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you confessed to him with your mouth. And you believed in your heart and you were saved. Okay, but after that, eternal life has been given to you. But most people don't do anything really. I mean, unless you want me just to lie to you. Most people, they go into neutral now and they are waiting for the prophets to say the date when Jesus is coming back. They wait for the prophets to say, Who's, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? What's going to happen next? And the devil's listening to all this, and he's going to make sure it doesn't happen. Okay, but everyone since, since Jesus left has been waiting for him to come back. Everyone. So Paul in Thessalonians in 70 AD, 65, 70 AD said, listen, you guys, if you don't work, you don't eat. Go get your jobs back because the coming of the Lord is going to be after these certain things are going to happen. There's going to be a revelation of the Antichrist, the the son of perdition. But these things have to happen. And they can't happen with he who is in place. Once that is removed, then the end shall come, like, like he said. So we have been waiting every generation thinking that this was the generation. But think about it's been 2,000 years and everybody's been waiting. So what happens is we don't allow an inheritance to go to our children. And I'm just not talking about money here. I'm talking about the fact that Abraham transferred to Isaac and Isaac transferred to Jacob and Jacob, Joseph. And you, you have this su- succession and, and it's the same with the disciples. Jesus poured into the 12. And he poured into the 70. But out of all the thousands and thousands of people that followed him, because he had feeding of the 5,000, 120 showed up because Jesus said, stay here until the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so only 120 were there. Out of all those people that got fed, you know they saw the bread appearing in the basket. They, you know they saw the healings. 
you, he, they heard him, but they didn't, they didn't take him into their hearts. So when you take healing into your heart, you're going to get healed because it's, it's like what Jesus said. You take his, his flesh and his blood, which is the bread and the, and the wine or the grape juice, and you take it inside of him as a symbol. But Jesus said, do this as often until I come. Paul said the same thing. But Paul said, many of you are sick and die early because you don't, when you come together to take communion, you don't uh, do it correctly. You don't discern the Lord's body. Okay, so he said you're drinking judgment upon yourself when you drink those. But see, that's not preached. And Paul said, listen, that one, that's, that what he's doing is worse than what the world does. He said, hand him over to Satan. And he actually said he wasn't there physically. So Paul said, listen, when you gather together and the spirit of the Lord is there and my spirit is with you, hand this one over to Satan. So they did it right after the offering, of course, because you got to take the offering first. <laughs> but think about this. This was part of a service. So you got, you got the announcements, you got the baby dedications, you got the baptisms, you got the offering and the communion, and then, okay, now those who have been chosen to be handed over to Satan, please come forward. Okay, so this, but this was the way the early church was. Okay, but they owned it because they, they were in houses and they were hiding at times. And they shared with each other their food and, and they encouraged each other because being a Christian would cost you your life. So the cost was really high. So what happened was if you wanted to be a Christian, you really had to think it through because you were considered a dead man walking. That's the mindset back then. Okay, so you fast forward to 2,000 years and you just do the math and save me an hour of having to talk about it. Okay, so now we're right here and we're waiting for his coming just like in Thessalonians. However, it was the presence of the church on the earth that was keeping the Antichrist from not appearing, according to Thessalonians. So it's the case now. So I have always felt, just in the seven years I've been doing this, and that phase is over next week. It's over. Seven years is over, and then we're going to go into another phase. So it'll be different because the Lord's already telling me what I'm supposed to do. But that phase was the sowing of the word and, and putting the emphasis on owning it and really considering that what do you want to hand off to your children because if your end time DVD series doesn't come out good, if it, if it doesn't pan out, you're going to have to throw it away like you have in every generation. And when things don't work out, you got to understand Satan is always pushing the timeline. He's always wanting to appear. He's always wanting to see his boy. Do you get that? Okay, but it's always prevented. It's always delayed because you wake up and you start swinging. You get together and you pray with people. You, you, you read the word, you believe it, you exercise authority. And when you pray for somebody, you totally expect them to be healed. Yes. When, or, you know, and God, when, you, when God hears your prayers, you know that he's a good God. He's a good father. Paul said that it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. It's not the fear of hell. Paul never said the fear of hell leads people to repentance. You see, I'm telling you, a lot of people converted for the wrong reason. The reason I say that, it's not the wrong reason in the sense of nobody should go to hell. It's the wrong reason when you're in a trench and you got to get along with the people in the trench because there are no enemies in the trench in war. You all learn to work together. But does it, does it have to be the way it is to get people to get along when you have to share your box of Cracker Jacks with somebody? When you have to take half your sandwich 
and give it to someone else because we all got to live and, and fight together. See, it shouldn't come to, the, to these things. And that's what it's been for me at Warrior Notes is, is I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to let off on the pressure of, towards the devil. I'm not going to let off. If I'm going to go to the healing rooms, I expect people to get healed. Yes. I'm going to fight the devil. I'm not going to like, like, did you feel anything? No. It doesn't matter. You're going to stay in there and pray. And you're going to say, you're going to tell them, I'm going to believe for you. But one day, you're going to solo. You're, you're going to grab this on your own. By his stripes, you are healed. When you give in the offering, you're giving to God. I would hope so. I wouldn't hope you were giving to get somebody's anointing or a word. Because that would never happen, would it? <laughs> the process is that Jesus Christ came and did it. He went back and was seated. And now he said, you do it. So what are we going to do? We're not going to sit and watch our end time DVDs and try to figure out who the Antichrist is. It's pretty obvious who he is. And, and he's always got his boy in every generation. He just never gets seated. So you, it, you can see using your calculator, a slide roll, or counting your toes and fingers, you can see that certain people add up to 666. Yep. But they weren't seated because you woke up again. Okay, this is overthrow. This, amen. So this is, this is going from a breakthrough, breakthrough. Okay, I got, I got through that. Well, I don't want to get through something. I want the devil to be talking about me for at least 10 years. And I want him to still have his bandages on when I hit him again. I don't want it even to heal. I don't want his wounds to heal. I want him to get up and say, I think he hit me twice, but I couldn't count how many times he hit me. I thought it was once, but I got two bruises. You got to have this mentality because that's the mentality I have about life now that I met Jesus face to face. I met him. He changed my life and I was a Christian, but I met the real Jesus, which is the red letters in the Bible, which is no gray area. No, I, I never walk away from Jesus thinking, I wonder what he meant by that. It was always clear. And that's, if you look at the people that I have in my life, they're those kind of people. The kind of people I like around me are, are, are clear cut. They don't lie. They don't, they don't make it gray. They don't like have an agenda where they have a, a way out. I mean, who wants to be in a trench with a soldier that has, is planning a way out besides fighting? I mean, do you want that kind of person watching your back that's looking for a way of escape? I mean, the most, the most complimentary thing you can do is die for a friend. But to die for your enemy, to sacrifice your life and consider yourself as not as great as someone else. That's what Jesus had in his heart is he took it upon himself for us, but he does expect us to do something with that. And in heaven, the people that are there, they don't want us to maintain what they did down here. So Paul, all these people, Peter, they are expecting us to build on what they did, not maintain what they did. Now think about that. Think about that. You got to have the goal that you're building a temple because that's what we're building. The body of Christ is talked about as a temple, a building for God. We're a body. He's the head. We are all of the parts of the body. We're parts of the building. The, the, the apostles and the prophets, it says, built the foundation. There's no apostles today writing scripture. There's no prophets that are writing scripture. Those, those people, Paul, were writing the New Testament. Today, the fivefold ministry is of a different caliber. 
And what they do, according to Ephesians 4, is to build up the body, to speak towards the body so that, Paul says, so that the body can go forth and do the ministry, is what it says. That's why they told the apostles, you don't have to wait tables anymore. We're going to have you pray, fast and pray and study the word. And so Stephen, who was not one of the fivefold, but had more miracles than most apostles today, and wasn't even a fivefold, he had notable miracles that says, and he was just waiting tables, and they stoned him because he spoke by the Spirit. And the Pharisees gritted their teeth and, and stoned him, and, and Saul, who was Paul, was one of them. So it's not just having a title or a status in the body of Christ. He who is the greatest is a servant of all, and that is still the truth that you're judged by. Okay, so you have to flip it on everything that is in your life that's hardship. You got to flip it and make it your own and then like it. See, and so what happens is, is all the fear and all the, the way that you think and you defeat yourself in your own thought process. All that is flipped when you go, you know what, this is fun. Can I have some more? And then all the demonic, all the fear, all the, all the, the, the demons and your crazy relatives, include that in the same group, you know, and they, they, they're, they're working together against what God's doing in your life. If you flip it and say, that was wonderful, can I have some more? Can I have another manual to memorize? Well, if you start doing that and you start liking it, and like Chris, me and him are the same. He goes, I would rather fly. Like he goes, you want to go flying again? I go, don't you want to eat? He goes, I, I would fly before I'd eat. I, this guy is already retired, and he loves to fly. Sven's like that. Lou's like that. Carol's like that. They, they, all the pilots are like that. They would rather like, well, but it was hard to get where they're at. That's what I'm saying. So with a, being a Christian, there is a narrow way. And the narrow way, trust me, it is ultimate keto. <laughs> it's, it is so hard that Jesus said, few find it, few find it. So even you being here and doing uh, all that you did to get here and to, to, to spend time this weekend, all that, that my staff and, and, and all the, even the contractors that work for us, they put forth so much to, to, to come into this small section of time just to do this. The effort that's just there, it can't be for the money and it can't be for recognition because we're not really getting any recognition for it. We're, we're laboring for others because others are valuable and we believe strong enough in what we're doing and what we, we believe in him, the Lord, that it motivates us to go beyond, um, well, I don't feel like it or I don't know if I'm really, I'm not really set on this. You do it because you're called to do it, but I'm called to serve. So in every, every time that the plane, they, that sometimes they have to bring the airplane to us because it's in the shop or whatever. And, and I'm supposed to go into the cockpit and get it all set up and put the flight plan and everything. And, and I'm back there loading the luggage. And the other pilot's like, oh, no, you know, you don't have to do that. You just, you just go get ready. I said, please let me load the luggage every flight because this is what I say, because I want to remember where I came from. I don't want to ever think. And so I want, I, I want to make sure that I am I'm working like I worked for other ministries and I made them look really good and, and, I, and, and some of them spit on me and, they didn't, and I didn't even get paid for it. Kathy and I did, but we kept doing it because we were, we were serving and we've served most of our life. And that's why we we're working full-time jobs and we served others. We moved to other cities to help other pastors build their church up. And when people would say, why don't you be the pastor? I'd say, that'll never happen. They were already trying to get 
a division going. Well, I like how you teach. I like, I like your style. I'm like, that's never going to happen. I said, I'm going to always be behind the pastor, and I'm, we're always going to be second in command because the first in command gets shot at all the time. <laughs> so I'm going to hide behind the pastor. So every time that somebody would say something, I would say, well, we'll, uh, we'll talk to the pastor. It's like, no, we want you to be the pastor. Like, that ain't going to happen. Same with the music ministry. Same thing with the music ministry. The devil likes to snipe music ministry, music ministers. I just want to be in an orchestra pit. I didn't even want to be noticed. Because everything that's been given to me was God himself. It's not me. I, I can't take any credit for any of this stuff. Okay, this is what happens when you flip it. When you flip it on the devil and you say, you know what? I'm a lifer no matter what. Yes. And when you humble yourself under God's mighty hand, that is when he's going to promote you. If you submit to him and you want to serve, then God can trust you. Yes. Is everybody hear that? Can I go on or am I going to have to go back to Mr. Potato Head? Okay, all right. Okay, all right, so... A couple of things we've got to lay out, lay out um, it, this mentality that Jesus gave. In Matthew 16, 24, it says, Jesus said to the disciples, and Kevin's st saying to the students what Jesus is saying to me, I'm saying to my, to, to my disciples, um, I'm following Jesus, you're following Jesus, but there are teachers in the body of Christ, and um, I feel like I'm, I'm fathering people. I'm mentoring, I'm fathering people. So I'm, I'm a lifer, I'm gonna stick it out with you. But if, if you start to push back and resist, there's nothing I can do for you. Because if you're resisting what God is doing in your life, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter who it is. If you're resisting God, God can send you an angel and you can, you can not listen to him. So you might get on Sid Roth and, buy, and get a book. But did you, did you really take it into your heart and own it? Because that's who I want in the trench with me. I've been in situations where, so, where we were in a situation and that person turned to me and I said, we're gonna get out of this alive. I mean, I've had a fight. I should be wow. dead many times. But I fought because I knew it wasn't God's will. You have to have that fight in you to want to live. But when you live, you got to make the devil feel your pain. You got to make him feel pain. Yes. You, you got to make it so that the next time he even thinks about it, he remembers the pain. Yes. Come on now. Yes. Okay, so how you could do that is be wise. Is be wise, be preemptive. If if the Lord is telling you to cleanse your body and get the heavy metals out, not your knees, not your metal in your knees, or, you know, I'm not talking about hinges and things like that. I'm talking about the stuff that they put in the environment that could be affected by waves and, and things that are coming from, you know, maybe a tower or something, you know, maybe uh, some G things, you know. And it would start to cook you from within. You know, just put a piece of foil in a microwave. You'll get the idea of what I'm talking about here. So if you had that metal inside of you, what, and there's microwave towers, well, what do you think that's going to do to your body? And you're going to think it's the disease of the week. It might not be the disease of the week. It might be the frequency of the week. Okay, what if, what if, what if the Lord was telling you? I'm, I'm, I'm being, you know, I'm being kind of funny because he's, he's already told me, is you got to get, you got, you got, not much longer left to get rid of this junk in your body. So just get some chlorophyll, take some alfalfa tablets, take something, you know, uh, cilantro oil, something that'll take the heavy metals out. I'm being bold and, and making sure that they don't take me off because you don't got much more time to do something. You can be proactive about this. The, you know, what the, the perfect delivery system for the next thing is the mosquito. But then you, if you do your research, you'll find out who's involved with all that already and it's already being, they're already being hibernized and released. Okay, well, then 
you want to kill mosquitoes when you see them. Okay, these kind of things only come because the Spirit is telling you things to come. He, but if he can't talk to you because you're not really sure if tongues is for today, you're still arguing about if the earth's round or not. Or if Mr. Potato Head is really a, a, a he. Okay, see, if you're, if you're struggling with these basic things that Paul said, we got to go on to meet. We've got to get out of the diapers, get out of the, off the milk, and, 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 and stop being a snowflake Christian. So when it goes to 33 degrees, which is one degree above freezing, you all melt. Jesus doesn't train people to be snowflake Christians. He trains people to be leaders and to stand up when no one else will and say, you know what? Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Right? Okay. All right. So if anyone wishes to come after me in Matthew 16, 24, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He said this before anyone knew he was going to die on a cross. All right, so that's just the way it is. He said so many times, if you look at all the scriptures where he said, and unless you do this, no part of me. There's so many hard scriptures that have that before it. And those are not preached because they don't, they don't, they don't make you popular. They don't make you rich. Doesn't bring in the money, doesn't get you a book deal. Talking about self-denial, you know, putting the flesh to, to the sword. Those kind of things are not popular, but they are in heaven, and everybody up there would preach it if they had a chance to come back. But down here, we're the ones with the mic, and we don't preach it, okay? But this is how you get to overthrow. You have to lose your life in order to gain it. You, you have to be willing to value others and then God will come in and show you your value, but you have to reach out to others. You cannot give toward a person's anointing. You give to people that cannot do it themselves. You, they cannot pay you back. You minister to people and God gives you the anointing. God gives you all things that have to do with the kingdom. Everything comes to you. I don't know what you've been watching, but you ought to watch what's happened in the last seven years with me. It's not, it was never a fundraiser. I'm saying, please stop giving. I mean, you've heard me. I've told, I've, I mean, and the minister's like, oh, he's done. He said that. Don't give. Oh, he's done. Oh, I'm still waiting. Oh, don't give to the poor. You know, there's no reward for that. It's like, really? He who lends, you know, he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and he gives great dividends. What about that scripture? That's still in there. Check tonight. It's still in there. Okay. Anyway, so Jesus' mentality about those who followed him was totally different than the American culture. And the American culture got into Christianity all over the world because they, uh, ministers went everywhere. But the bottom line was, is that I go to cities that no ministers go to because there's no money there. So I, I don't even take offerings in certain cities. We actually give out money. And, and I can name these cities, but all my friends are watching and they're mad, they're mad at me anyway. But the bottom line is, is that why would you not go to El Paso? There's a certain country, the countries I go to, there's no money there. So I don't even take offerings. And if I do, I give it right back to the people. Okay, the, the motivation for preaching the gospel should not be because of money or, or not money. It shouldn't be if people get healed or not healed or if a devil leaves or doesn't leave. You go and you preach the gospel and God performs miracles. The demons have to go. You have to have, I don't want to get into this because I'll spend the next hour on this, but devils know if you, if you really know. Yes. 
And they believe more than you do about God. They just don't want you to be fully convinced. They don't want you in the manual studying and finding the truth. There's, the truth is there, but some of it you have to dig for. And the Lord told me to be a self-feeder because I was complaining that I wasn't getting fed like I felt I needed to because I felt like uh, there was something going on with my life that Lord had his hand on my life, but I was not being fed to the level where I felt like I would need in order to get there. So when I, I asked the Lord and I was complaining, it's like, why do I have to pray in tongues for an hour and a half just to go to church, just to tolerate church? And for a, a prayer meeting, to go to a prayer meeting, me and my wife would have to pray an hour in tongues just to be able to go to the prayer meeting and make it through without slapping somebody. <laughs> Not my wife, but I mean, she, she was fine. It's me. But at least I use a backhand, not the full hand. I use a backhand and a half mast, not like the full thing. No jewelry on, you know, so the damage is minimal. Now think about it. I have to pray up just to go to church. It's the same, same thing. Why is it that Benny Hinn can sing hallelujah 400,000 times in a service and people are laid out? The same word. And the power of God is so strong. He didn't go to any seminar. He, he might know Bethel, he might not. He might know Hillsong, he might not. But what is it about certain people, when they do something that is, is, is unconventional, it's not, it's not the norm, so to speak, and yet God moves. It's because those people, I have spent time talking to these people. They own it. They sacrifice their whole life. They've given up everything. And the anointing was so strong, not just in the meetings, but sitting on the couch or at a table with them. But then there's other ministers. There's nothing. But they're bigger than anybody. But there's nothing. There's nothing there at all. There's nothing. But it's always about like this many years ago, this happened and all this. Same with Assemblies of God, places like that. They talk about all that God did in you know, Azusa Street and, and Hot Springs, Arkansas, when they formed. And, you know, John G. Lake was there, you know, at Hot Springs. He signed the book. Well, why didn't he join? Oh, we don't know. Well, he went back and cleaned up the city and emptied the hospitals. And got the key to the city from the mayor for Spokane. But he, he just said, I, I just called to do healing rooms. Now think about it. He didn't join the Assemblies of God. But he shut down two hospitals out of three. It was named the healthiest city. And he just sat, had healing technicians sit and read scriptures and pray over people. They said, you can't stay more than 30 days but no one ever stayed more than 15, and everybody got healed. Okay, so what would it matter if they have a degree or if they're with this person or that person? What it was is John T. Lake hated sickness like he hated sin. He, he, he hated sickness like he hates sin. And Catherine Coleman, don't speak against the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve him. He's all I got. See, she had, no, she had given up everything, and that was her breath. Her next breath was his exhale. Exhale was what she breathed in. So the real heroes are the ones that were servants that left everything for not just the gospel, but for the body, so that the body could, could benefit from the ministry. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Okay, so that's the way the men, Jesus taught this way. This was the, the mentality of the early church, but it was lost when the gospel was spread and people took the gospel, they started to get healed, they started to get delivered, 
they started to prosper. And those people eventually went to other countries and affected the, the government and affected the constitution that was written. And it was all about giving the nation to God. And this went on, but there was infiltration the whole time through the Masonic line. Uh, and uh, Mystery Babylon is the Masonic line. And Nimrod was the first Mason who became Gilgamesh to try to hide. He went east to Ur of Chaldees, to Samaria. He was, in Hebrew, one of the mighty ones, one of the hybrids. So the, that line infiltrated every profession. So it doesn't matter if you're a red state or a blue state. Those people are bought. And they have to do exactly what they're told. You call them rhinos. Listen, what are you all looking at me for? <laughs> okay, so Satan infiltrated even the very foundation in this country. And you are wondering, like, why this is happening. It's happening because it, it's, been, it's been this way from the beginning. The, 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 the serpent has always tried to get into the human genome, always into the DNA, into the blood, always trying to infiltrate, always trying to inhabit leaders and, and influence and get groups of people to drink blood and, and to sacrifice. Come on now. See, no one else is going to talk about this. In church, anyway. So I got to get Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. But at what point do you realize that if Jesus was driving out devils, then we're supposed to drive out devils? Okay, right? Okay, but they, 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 they don't understand nice. The only thing they listen to is roughness. You got to be rough with them. So before you even say something, you should be slapping them across the head. You should be stomping your foot. You should you say, uh, you know, I'm about to open a can here. You, you're like, you, you have to like, you have to be, have an attitude. And they, that's what I'm trying to say is they know this. They know if you're fully convinced yeah. or not. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The ineffectiveness that you feel, the defeat you feel is because you're not convinced. You say you are. You go through all the motions because John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth did this and, and Kenneth Hagin and all these people did this. But the devils know if you know. And that's why at times in the Bible, there were demons that said, well, you know, I know Paul and I know Jesus, and I, but I don't know who you are. And these people were using the name. They were uh, somehow preaching something but the devils wouldn't leave and they, 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 they took their clothes off of them. They had to go to Ross Dress for Less and get more clothes. Why, why could a devil do that when they were preaching in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches? It's because they, they weren't true sons and daughters. They didn't discern God as their father. They didn't have a, a, an experience a born-again experience where it was is experiential knowledge. So like I was telling the kids, you can't just go to ground school for years and be a good pilot. You gotta actually fly sometime. And you gotta be able to transfer into the, the environment of shock and awe. All that you learn, now it's like, now I gotta do all this stuff. So you can pass the test, written tests and oral tests, and then you go out and they pull an engine on you and, and they just sit there and they're not going to help you. So if you have two engines, you only have one, which it can be really messed up. But then like with what we were flying today, we only have one. And you don't have to pull off the side of the road and read your manual. <laughs> there are no pull-offs up there. 
So the, everything's managed ahead of time. It's the same thing with the Spirit of God. Don't you think that the Spirit knew all this stuff and knew our condition? Don't you think that if you had believed, you would have received? Because that's what Jesus said all the time. He said, why'd you doubt? Why'd you fear? And he'd give Peter a towel and dry him off because he, he sunk. But at least he walked on the water. And, and at least, at least uh, you know, it, it ended well. But if you look at the way Peter wrote after Jesus left, Second Peter's amazing. And chapter one says, you can be, if you would partake of the divine nature by implementing the promises that were given. So all these precious promises that were given to us, he said that, that, that through these precious promises, we can be partakers of the divine nature. Well, that'll get you kicked out of church talking about you're a partaker of the divine nature. Who do you think you are? A devil will leave your family alone if he knows he's going to get slapped. But he's the one that has to know it. You can't just think you know it. It's got to be known in hell. You've got to be posted in hell. Your picture has to be down there and say, stay away from this person because they will give you a whipping See, the thing of it is, is it's not just truth. Now, think about this. Most of the government would not be concerned about me saying things if they knew you weren't going to believe it or if you weren't going to do something about it. The power comes when people die for speaking the truth, like former presidents, former uh, uh, you know, leaders, they, Jesus. It started with Jesus, David. They all were leaders, but if you notice the conversation, their dialogue was they were giving power back to the people. Now think about it. All the speeches, Ronald Reagan, Kennedy, you can, you can, you listen to them. Robin Hood, <laughs> you know, what he was doing is, is the government wasn't doing things. And so Robin Hood was, was just robbing from the, the rich and giving it to the poor. He was just doing what they should have done in the offering in the church on Sunday. Now think about it. There were offerings taken in the New Testament that never left the church. They were given to the poor. This is in, Rome, this is in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Of course, in the book of Acts, it corresponds with that, that timeline. Okay, so breakthrough is I'm going to give towards this. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get this. So you get breakthrough because, of course, you're, you're, it's a principle. But overthrow is when you show up and there's little white flags everywhere because the demons just opt out. Okay, so really what your life has been up to a certain point should speak louder than your tongue. Your life should have an impact in the spirit realm to where wherever you go, things are breaking up and things are having to be corrected uh, demons are mouthing off because they can't stay quiet around you. They start to defend their position. If you notice everywhere Jesus went, he wasn't looking for devils, but they couldn't stay silent. When he got near them, they started mouthing off. Why? Because they knew they were done. He thought, and I know this, the demons thought Jesus could see them. So if the devils, if people act up around you, it's because the devils think you're going to cast them out. Yeah. And they, 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 they're managing their position by trying to get you to back off. So what people will do is reject you so that you pull back. Rejection is one of their tools. Yeah. But if you're going into overthrow... You're like, oh, no, we're going to be good friends. I'm staying, I'm staying for two meals. And, and, and we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get this right. I'm the, uh, you know, you're assigned to people, and the devils have to go. It's intercession, but it's your life. So it's not you pacing the floor all the time. It's you feeding people and being with people and mentoring people and, and encouraging people and being the hand of God in somebody else's life. Let the hand of God come on you, but then you transfer it out. All right, that's my introduction. So now I've got 15 minutes to finish 18 pages of notes here. Okay, 
All right, so. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens, not the slanty-eyed ones, and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. Okay, so we know that Peter didn't use the word for spirit here. He used the word that's, that's the Greek word for psychology or, or your, your psych, psychic realm. So your mind, will, and emotions is the word that's used here. So it's, it's war against your soul. Because as a believer, your spirit is born again and occupied. The, the demons want to seek to get into your intellect, into your emotions, so that they could hijack you. They don't want you completely. They just want to use you. And I, I know this to be a fact. I just don't know how to tell people, so I'm just going to be blatant with you. It's because what I was taught by the Lord is that demons were told, you got to get the humans to do your work for you. You don't want them to, to die. And you don't want them to get delivered from you. You just want to placate them and do whatever you need to do to become friends with them to where they feel bound and you can use them as a missile to damage others and to affect the body of Christ. And so this is what we're dealing with. It's, it's a soulical thing. It's the soul. It's the psychological part. The weapons of our warfare, Paul said, are not carnal, right? But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it says, but then it says this, and bringing into captivity every thought. Anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, you have to bring into captivity. The word there is to incarcerate, to bring it and apprehend it and handcuff it. And take it away, every thought. Anything that is contrary to what the truth of the gospel is, it has to be handcuffed and incarcerated. Do you get that? That's what it's saying in the Bible. Peter is saying this, that it's not this spiritual battle that you're wrestling with demons. It's them trying to get you to do it for them through hijacking. Mm -hmm. So they've got to convince you that you're less than who you are. Yep. They got to convince you that you're not strong enough. And that is correct because he's strong. Yes. The Lord is. The so you have to become less in order to become greater. You have to become a servant mm -hmm. in order. If you walk in love and you serve people, the devils don't have a, any way to operate. If you give to poor, then God's going to have to pay you back because yes. they aren't. So it gets out of the Christian cartel and the Christian cartel that's been built into the body of Christ has corrupted it is that you pay to play. You, you do something for me and I'll invite you to my church or you say this on TV and everything's going to be fine. But if you say this, you're never coming back. It's like, yeah, but it's in red letters. I got to say it. And so you get to the point where you tell people, ministry's not worth going to hell over, so I quit. So that's why I became Captain Kevin. Because, I, I, I mean, that way I can just go talk about Jesus. I could fly. I mean, if Chris wants to, we could fly upside down half the way here if we wanted to. And when I land, it's like, well, we don't know how to define you. Perfect. Where's the pulpit? Because it's, the, it's, it's, it's not just the message. It's the experience. Every one of you should be experiencing the power of God in this room. Yes. Not because you gave or you didn't give. Not because I blew on you or there was some sort of anointing or mantle here. Because you know, those people that did that, that was their manifestation. That might not ever happen again. I mean, I've been blown on and I had to crawl to my car, but I can't, I can't manufacture that. That's not my anointing. What's in this room is the Father's anointing. Yeah, you know, this, is this isn't some man or woman. 
This is the time for the body of Christ to get together and we agree as touching any uh, one thing and it shall be done for us. This was always the will of God. Paul said that this was the will of God. The mystery has been revealed. He talks about it in Ephesians and in Colossians. He said that the mystery that was hidden in the past has now been revealed. So there is no more mystery. He said it's been revealed. The manifold, the manifold wisdom of God has been revealed through the church, plural, not singular, not one, you know, not Mr. Potato Head. It's the whole Idaho field of potatoes. It's the, it's the whole thing, all of us together. So what happened was, and the correction had to happen, and I waited and waited and waited. The correction had to happen because we place people above us and we pay them to do our job for us. So you're going to pray for me. You're going to preach me into the fire. You're going um, to, to do the prayer meetings. You're going to do the communion. You're going to do my funeral. You're going to visit me in the hospital. And, and I'm, we're going to pay you. And so then the pastor says one week, you pray for yourself. I'm not praying for you anymore. And this is what James said. You know, if somebody is going through a hard time, they should pray. It doesn't say have somebody pray for you. So James, you know, probably wouldn't be on TV, you know, because he was always, if you look, if you read James, he's always placing the responsibility back on the body because he was called to the body. And Paul said, you have many teachers, but you don't have many fathers. And he said, I birthed you. I'm your father and I'm jealous over you. He would, he would talk to them because he was birthing them. So, okay, so this is the, the reality check is, did Jesus ever take an offering? Okay, did he ever have a worship team? All right, but see, we have all those now, but Jesus operated under the anointing of the Father. He said he didn't do anything on his own, so it wasn't his anointing, even though it's prophesied he was the Messiah and that the yoke-breaking anointing's on him and the governments are on his shoulders and that. But see, he was preexistent. He was always that, but he became a servant. He considered being equal with God as not being grasped, it says, but became a servant he laid it aside. That's why he always told the demons, shut up when they said, we know who you are. Because he wanted to be known as the son of man because then he could say, you go and do it. If he was doing things as the son of God, he couldn't say to us, go do it because he was doing it as deity. And last time I checked, none of us were that. But we're reaching that point eventually of perfection, okay? All right, so... Overthrow is, is living in dominion, which means that disease can't exist anywhere near you. you. You still have to believe in Psalms 91. So you're, my immune system is like thumbs up. Can you say that again? So I'm going to say it again. You know, you should be living in dominion where diseases can't have any part of you. See, your immune system is set up through what you hear and you see, and your body responds with chemicals and all kinds of hormones based on what you see and you hear and what you think about yourself or a situation. So automatically, when you see a movie, that's why Hollywood did what they do with movies, is they wanna place you in a scenario where they can imprint you and, and have your body respond to that. So, I mean, I quit after the first Jurassic Park. I mean, I went out of that movie and I was looking under my car for raptors. Okay, why? Because that experience of going through that movie, it was so real that I might, I'm just telling you, your body doesn't know if it's real or not because your mind is not discerning truth or not. It's just experiencing this and it's producing that experience through, through all kinds of hormones and chemicals. You're, it starts in your brain and it tells all your organs to respond a certain way. So 
you might see a movie of somebody falling off a cliff and you feel like you're falling off a cliff. And it creates a fear and you're nowhere near a cliff, right? And you can have a dream about someone that you love and wake up being mad at them and treat them bad all day over a dream that had nothing to do with real life. But that imprinted you. You have fear about your children and how they're going to turn out. But the whole thing is, is that where are you getting that imprint that they're going to turn out that way when actually you're the one that can determine that? Because by the way that you treat them and talk to them and by teaching them to frame their world and say the thing that steers their life in that direction. It's a ship, right? The tongue's a ship. And that's what James said. So it's, it's steering your life through your words. That's why Jesus said we should speak to mountains. But, you know, how many mountains have been removed? Is Shasta still there? I mean, you know, like when, when I wake up and I see mountains flying through the air, I know that people are starting to believe the gospel. You know, I'm starting to take it in there. What I'm saying is, is that the mountain that's in your way may be there for the glory of God. It may be that you need to respond in the correct way. Okay, so this is what happens. Truth is presented and people have a choking point. So Jesus said, just going through these scriptures, he said, listen, he determined there were too many people following him. He, so he said, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part in me. He said, they all left him that day. He turned to the disciples and said, are you going to leave me too? And they said, where would we go? We, you know, they left their jobs. He said, but they said this, you have the words of life. They all left their jobs. They all left their families. You got to remember, they were married. Paul was the only one that wasn't married. I mean, I don't know who else was, but, you know, let's, let's just say that, that most of them were married. How do you explain that? He walks by and you just start walking with him and, and he asks, what are you doing? And you say, I don't know. That's what happened. They didn't even understand it. That's like you don't understand it. But breakthrough goes to overthrow when you own it. But owning it is going to cause you to be a history maker. It's not going to be normal and it's not going to preserve who's come before you. I have had visions even this week the same vision I've had for many, many years. I have a vision where everything disappears. I just had it right now and it reminded me of it. I just had it again. And there was no footprints in front of me. There's, the Lord says, where I'm taking you, no one has ever been. Okay, so he tells me to do things that are uncommon out of the box and then he tells me to burn the box and that's what he told us about warrior notes is step out of the box and then burn the box so all the prophecies that have come, come to me have been recently, like with, with people that you would know, is I saw you go through a door and it was a sliding door. It closed behind you and it is sealed. You cannot go back. That is God. And these are, everyone in this room would know who that is. But I've also had people say, to me, all, I mean, all my, all my Christian life, since I got saved, I've had people come and prophesy to me and say that you will have a small ministry, but God's going to use you. And they would say, these, these are major prophets, you know, I'm a minor prophet, but they, these are major prophets that said, I'm going to have a big ministry, them, but you're going to have a small ministry, and the Lord just wanted me to tell you that. I have never been told that I would have a big ministry, never been told it would be a worldwide ministry. I've been told I would amount to nothing. When I started this, I was told by a, a, not a, a big apostle that I will disappear within a year and a half. And, and that was six, five and a half years ago. Now why would somebody say that?
Okay, so I could tell you stuff that happens weekly. If I would take what's being said, I would never go anywhere because that's was, if I let that steer me, I'd just be a smoking hole. And then we could all be smoking holes and like have the smoking hole movement. You know, like where we just say, you know, we get the banjo and gloom, despair, and agony on me. Whoa. You got the banjo and you got the guitar and you got people in suspenders, you know, and hee haw, you know. And all of us find a common ground and we all are like, oh, we're all just rejects. You know, we're the ones on the island, the toy, the misfit toys, you know, waiting for Santa Claus to come. Thank God that, that Rudolph, you know, reminded them, please stop and get the misfit toys. So is that what you want? Do you want to be like, you know, are you going to stop fighting and just like say, you know what? We'll just start our own movement. And see, this is what happens. People start movements based on a revelation, but it's, it's, it's not the standard that God is saying for the church. It ends up being more in, about individuals and focusing on certain favored individuals and of course, if you keep giving to them, they're going to prosper. But if those people have to go and work for a living, then they become just like you. And that's why it's so important to be accountable. So being accountable means that God is standing with you and you go to overthrow because the demons are looking at who's with you. Okay, so that's what happens after tonight. After this message, that's what happens. You're more aware of what's happening in the spirit realm. So the demons are notified. Now, I'm not, I'm not messing around and I'm not kidding with you. And it's 9.03. It's so early. It's still early. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, but, but, but the change, I'm saying this not as anybody special. I'm saying this as a, humbly and as a servant to you that things can change right now and things can change tonight. But you have to be willing to be a lifer or a, a hundred percenter. And you have to be willing to eat large amounts of truth, which may mean that you have to judge yourself. And that's the problem is that we're not, we have a choking point. So, you could only take so much and then you don't want to hear it anymore. So then you don't want to go to church anymore. You don't want to listen anymore. It, you, if you have a church that you can go to that speaks the truth, there are a couple left, then you should go. If not, then you need to have a Bible study in your house and, and, and let God build it. That's what's happening. I mean, we have church, we have, I mean, Pastor Ryan, when I met Pastor Ryan seven years ago, he had about 25 people in, in his house. And now he owns like a whole strip mall thing, like almost all of it. They have a coffee shop. They have healing rooms. So you get your coffee, then you go get healed. And then you can get free, you got a pantry, you can get food. And then if you, if you and if that ain't enough, they, they give out money. And then you can go in there and go to church. Okay, this happens with Pastor Simmons too. Uh, they, they, these house churches, we have uh, one in Lafayette, Louisiana, they're watching the Comos. They, they started a warrior fellowship in their house. They had to get a building. So we bought them a van so they can go pick up people. Same with, with uh, you know, Pastor Jan and, and Dale. We bought them a van. It said, get a grill, start cooking out on Saturdays, and, and, and preach the gospel in the park or in a... And, and I'm bring, it's the same thing with uh, Pastor Ryan and Mike and Chris. We bought them a van. They bought a trailer that has a, a, a grill on it. And they just light that puppy up. I mean, <laughs> and people come and they say, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And this is what you have to do. You have to be proactive. If it's not happening, don't get mad at the local pastors. Pray for them, pray for the fivefold, but be a self feeder. In other words, build yourself up and become a solution to the problem because it's not going to get any better by being mad. It, it doesn't help at all, it actually paralyzes you. 
So the Lord just asked me in these last time, I have some scriptures, but he asked me to speak on rejection. And this is what happens on a Friday night. The Lord has me pick certain subjects within the subject as a prophetic service where I'm literally, I could pull you out. I could pull you out. Everything I've said so far is because I'm looking at people and he's, the Lord's saying, say this, look this way, but they're over here and say this. He's, it's, he said, take out of the soil the rocks and the thorns. Make the soil receive the seed. And that's what I do on a Friday night. It's a prophetic service. And I have scriptures I've studied, but I have to speak on certain things. It would take too long to call you all up and give you a word and lay hands on you. And, and I know you'd want that. But the thing that makes you powerful in the trenches is learning the manual and learning to be a proactive soldier and not wait for someone else to do it. There is such a fight, there's such fight inside of you for the truth is that we have to be in situations where we're about to go under before we start swinging and fighting. But I'm telling you the truth. If you listen to me tonight, if you wake up swinging, I wake up in the morning and I just blast the devil. I get out of bed and I'm starting to blast the devil. And I'm, I'm saying, oh, you know, you, you better be ready. And I say, I start swinging. And I say, yes, I say yes to you, Lord. You haven't even told me what's going to happen today. But I know I'm flying. I know I'm preaching. I know, and I know that we're going to rip the skies open today. We're going to, wherever way we fly, the devils are going to be freaking out, be flying through their, how, their living room up there because they're the prince of the power of the air, flying right through their house, you know, right through their headquarters, you know. It's like, you just fly right through there, right through them. You, that's their, that's, that's where they live up in there, the heavenlies, you know. So you're like, I think that was Kevin just flew through my living room, you know. You know. And as you fly by, you just go, I'm watching you. <laughs> you got to have that attitude. You can't wait for somebody to hit you to protect yourself. You, you can't, like, you can't expect people to behave. You don't even behave. I mean, you, you, you know, look at yourself. I'm never going to do that again. So we have to put cameras on you so that you never do that again. All right, so you have to think, okay, if my thoughts are gonna be on that screen, what am I gonna be thinking about? Because every one of you are gonna see what I'm thinking. Okay, that's accountability as I see it being in heaven and coming back, is that everything is open and visible to the Lord Jesus Christ, as it says in scripture. Everything is open to the one that we have to give account to. It's all visible. It's not AI. It's the Almighty God. That's the one we have to be accountable to. And I'm telling you, if you flip it on the devil, you go to overthrow because he knows now this, we've lost them. They know there is no way, there's no way. No matter what we do to him, he's still going to serve God. And all these things, it says after every chapter in Job, it says in all these things, Job did not sin by blaming God. In all these things, Job did not sin by blaming God. So I want to talk about this rejection. If we're accepted in the beloved, as it says in, in Romans 8, 15, then what, where does rejection even get in? Rejection has to get in through the soul, through your mind, your will, and your emotions, because it's a status. We've been adopted, which means we haven't been rejected. We're accepted into the beloved, as it says. Okay, so it starts out in Romans 1 as saying that the, that the case against you is closed, is what it says in Aramaic. The case against you is closed. There, there is no record anymore. The case against you is closed. There's no condemning voice. There's no judgment. It's for the wicked. The wicked, wicked are judged. But the righteous are preserved and saved, right? So there's a status. So the Word of Faith movement gave that to us. They gave us all about the status. 
and how, how to stand firm in the word of God. But the relationship part of this has to do with the soul. The relationship you have with God has to be strong so that you know that, well, God didn't say that. You can tell the serpent, well, God did say. And I'm not talking to you anymore. That's what Eve should have done. Eve should have gave him the hand and said, talk to my husband and talk to God. You know, where was Adam? They needed to be together for this. And Satan must have done something because he isolated her. So he was playing it really bad. Okay, but Eve should have said, well, he, she shouldn't have been talking to a serpent about doctrine or about what God said. God came down every day and walked with them. So why does she need to talk to an animal about God and what he said? Think about what I'm saying here because that's what's happening right now in the world and in, in the body of Christ and in your life is you're questioning who you are. God didn't come down and talk to Satan or Lucifer. Or his name was Hillel. God came down and talked to Adam and Eve. The cherubim was left out. The one that covers the garden, the one who covers the sum of perfection, the one in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 as well. These, these things are in the scripture, but you've got to glean them, is that God came down to talk to his, his man and his woman. They had relationship. And I'm telling you, when they were walking with him, they were friends. Because even after they sinned, God said, where are you? Why are you hiding? He was friends with them. He talked to them in, in a sinful state. After they were kicked out of the garden, God still talked to them. They still lived hundreds and hundreds of years, and they were in sin. They were fallen beings now, and they, you couldn't kill them from the power that was in them, even for 900 years the power of God that was in them from the image of God, it took Adam 930 years to die. It took Methuselah 969 years to die. You couldn't kill the human beings, even in a sinful state. And God still visited and talked with them, appeared and tried to help. He even with Cain, he said, don't you know if you do right, you'll be accepted? But he said, you, he said sin is crouching at your door but you must master it. So it's free will. So how many of you are going to just say, well, you know, whatever God wants, he's going to have. Well, that's not necessarily true because God always gives us a choice to go on with him. If you want to settle for what you have, which I wouldn't, then you have to say, I'm engaging you. Show me the way. And he said, well, it's through me, which means you have to become less. You're going to have to scale down and fit through the narrow way. When you do that, that's when it opens up. See, favor, see, this is the thing. This is a problem. Just to show you how, how much false doctrine there is out there is you, you realize, right, that you never can give again in an offering, ever. Never give again and still go to heaven. But you wouldn't think that by the way you've been made to feel if you don't give. But Paul said that you have to be hilarious, feel hilarious about it, and be so happy and laughing when you give, because he loves a joyful giver. He loves a hilarious giver. If you don't feel that joy, then you shouldn't give, because you're being manipulated. You should give because that's what God is saying to do and you want to do it because you have a revelation of what that means. If you don't have a revelation of that, you can't expect to have a return on your giving because it's God that gives the increase. So did you give because you were strong-armed or you felt like you were, you, you were being coerced or you were obligated to support? 
Or did you do it because God said to do it and you have a revelation of what it is to sow and to reap and you're doing it even if you didn't get anything back? Would you give it because God wants it? Not a person, but God, you're doing it as an offering to him. You don't expect it back, but you know that he's a good God. You know you're going to get it back, but you're not doing it for that. Is God an ATM? Is he a slot machine? No, he's a person. So what happened was in the Word of Faith movement, you had a lot of the truth being, being proclaimed. But the only thing was is that only certain individuals had the relationship and they were very humble because of the relationship they had with God. And I noticed that God does more for humble people than he does, does for prideful people. Why? Because he resists the proud, which that word means to push back. I don't want God pushing me back because I know what that means. I'm on my own, which sums up a lot of our lives. It appears that we're on our own, but we believe and we trust God but it appears manifest wise, manifesting wise, that we're really just on our own. And it feels like that. I'll tell you why. Because we didn't discern that the last move of God is the glory of God, the Father coming on the body. It's the group of, it's the group. We all become one and not individuals anymore. And that is the last move. The last move was God the Father coming and, and having habitation on the body and the bride becoming without spot and wrinkle before the world, where the world wanted the church because we represented Jesus Christ on the earth. Enough to where the scriptures say that the Jews would be provoked to jealousy. Well, what... Do you ever hear them talk about money? No, because they have it all. You pay retail, they pay wholesale. So you don't hear about, you, they don't talk about money and how God's prospering them because Abraham's their father. It automatically comes because they're Jew. There's nobody here. Is there anybody here? I, am I breathing? So they're, they're, they're not even like, they don't give to get. Because they own everything. Israel has more patents than I think any country. You don't hear them talking about the things that we talk about. Because they're, they're, the, they're the Lord's inheritance. They're his people, you know. That's his country. That's his territory over there. You know, they... they they are away, they killed the Messiah, but God blesses them. See, no one else will say that, so I'll say it. But you got to remember, they killed Jesus. And they said, let his blood be on us and on our children. Thanks a lot, Dad. So now, now you wonder, like the Holocaust, you look at all this stuff. Well, they got what they asked for. See, this goes over well, doesn't it? Because no one will preach this. We all got to preach this. I'm not saying there aren't people. So rejection is not part of our lifestyle. It's not part of our thought process. We don't judge whether we're accepted or rejected on what happens in our life. It's what we know. It's what God has said. Okay, so now, just like what just happened now, and I've been waiting for this. Thank God it's... It's not going to be 10 o'clock. It's 920 is I felt a shift in the room because f you're, you're hearing the glorious gospel and the light is coming in, even though you're all Christians. But what's in here would get your governor saved because it's not a person that is flesh and blood. It's God himself is dwelling and abiding on the church. And we are supposed to be the ones that call the shots, which means if we agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done for us. It doesn't say any kind of thing in the, in the, in the, the fine print that says, except for in these cases, 
It says, if you ask, you receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door shall be opened, right? Okay, these are things that Jesus said that are in red that he meant. He didn't in any way disqualify them or diminish them by saying anything except for this case or that. He said, you're going to get it if you ask for it. He said, if I abide in you and you abide in me, you can ask whatever the word is desire, not, not need. It's the word want. Whatever you want, it shall be done for you. Why? Because the word of God is in you and you are in him. And that brings the other realm of supernatural events into this realm. So it, it, there should always be chairs flipping and people falling. There should always be uh, mountains moving and things vibrating and shifting and people saying, never mind, I'm not going to trash you. I don't know what just happened to me. I felt like something just hit me. They start to, they start to stop offending God. They stop doing the things they're doing. And I, I mean, I've had this happen. I've had people say to me, that, I mean, people that are in high up positions, they said, I mean, I, I mean, I was under this person. They said, when I, when I met John Osteen, the Lord said, cover yourself. You're in the, in the, in the midst of a general. And, and she goes, is there something wrong with what I'm wearing? She didn't have any inkling that she had done anything wrong. The Lord said, you cover yourself when you're in the presence of the general. So what happens with the high priest that all the garb, everything that, that was the way that they were supposed to be dressed so that you couldn't even see up under the, the skirt. Now, what I'm saying is, is that why do my friends who went to, to a country where they didn't wear clothes, they preached the gospel. They said the next day they came and wanted clothes. What was telling them that they needed to put clothes on? They wanted to cover themselves. Why did the man who was a demon-possessed man, when the demons left, why did he want? He came back clothed. Okay, the reason, the only reason I'm saying this is that, and not just picking on clothing, what I'm saying is we should also look at the fact that we may not be really convicted of the reality of, of what, who the Lord is in our life. So I know that Jesus is in here. I know that he's in here right now because there's more than two of you here. Even if half of you are asleep, there's still more than two. But in this group, Jesus is in the midst, okay? So I know that he either approves when the gospel's preached or he disapproves when it's not being preached. What he wants is for us to know what he did for us. If you meet him, if you meet him face to face, those, those times that I met him, all he wanted was people to know what he had done for them. If you think about the father, what did he want with Israel and with, with, through Moses? He wanted them to worship him, come up on the mountain and, and acknowledge what he had done. That he had kept his word after 400 years and delivered them. And it, all God wanted was to meet with them. What an opportunity. That is what has happened through the church. God created the, the church and created the fivefold and, and created this way that we preach the gospel and we, we, we meet together, we fellowship, we do outreach, we do these things. It was all the plan of God that Paul said from the beginning that through the church, the glorious mystery would be revealed, the manifold wisdom of God, which he says is to bring judgment. It's to declare it to the, the powers in the heavenlies. So the demonic right now is freaked out because they're hearing and they're seeing through the church the manifold wisdom of God. So I need all of us, not just people to get on Sid Roth or have a book out. It's not just, though, those are superheroes. You, you put them up like that and then you want to be like that. But I'm coming to you and telling you, you are like this. You all are. And that we need to build each other up. And if I can't serve you, if I can't help you, then am I really a fivefold minister? Because a fivefold minister is supposed to carry your luggage. They're supposed to serve you. Period. 
So how I judge if I'm, a, I'm walking or not is how the demonic responds, Come on. unfortunately. It comes down to, the, I know that the devils know. So if people don't engage, the devils will, will respond because they believe. Listen, they, they are fully convinced about Yahweh and who he is and what's going to happen to them. They're just hoping that the church doesn't move on it, doesn't do anything about it. So if we have to go back to houses and have Bible studies, then that's what we're going to do. If we're going to just start feeding the poor, I mean, people, they might not go to church, but they'll come and get food, you know? And that's what the Lord told me. He said, you're going to do the aviation. You know, um, Chris... Chris's company was so gracious uh, to help us to obtain that, that fighter jet for a year to do these kids program. The Lord says, those kids won't go to church, but they'll come watch you fly. <laughs> they'll come help you clean the airplane and look in the cockpit and take ground school. The Lord said that if you do this, they'll come in. So right now in this room, there's no demons. There's, and that's what I wanted to say about the shift. There's literally at 920, I felt the shift and every demonic force that was harassing you had to leave because they, they can't stand the light of the gospel. They cannot stand light. And what happened was, is your spirit, as you started to, to it started to click with you, they were losing their grip on you. And so they, they cut their losses and go They'll be waiting for you in the parking lot <laughs> when your neighbor uh, accidentally scratched your car on the way in, you know. <laughs> then, then the flesh, you know, pff, I'll get you, my pretty, <laughs> and your little dog, too. Okay, the warfare is in the area of rejection. But the, the warfare is really... Because Paul said this, the works of the flesh are evident. What is it in that list that is puzzling? I'll save you the time. Witchcraft. Paul calls witchcraft in that list works of the flesh. I thought it was a spiritual. I thought I was, I was fighting demons and rolling with them on the carpet. No, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. The entrance of an evil spirit is through the thought process and through the emotions and through creating scenarios where they enslave you. If you don't take the bait, if you don't allow yourself to go down that road, they, they have no power. And they will leave you. And this is what I know. I was shown that demons will leave you if you're not an easy target. Because they're looking for who they may devour. And if you're not edible, they just go on to somebody else. So you just don't be edible. Don't allow yourself. If, you, if they do not get a response, they will give up. They, they don't have a plan B. They do not have a plan B. They have, they, they, when they encounter a Christian that won't take no for an answer, they do not know what to do because they don't encounter Christians like that. They don't encounter Christians that actually after they've been hit, that, that hit back. Demons freak out when they find someone that actually hits back twice as hard. They don't know what to do. I'm just telling you the truth. They don't know what to do with a Christian that actually responds back. You get a thought about rejection, being rejected, or something's a uh, failure or whatever, or somebody looks at you wrong or doesn't look at you, or you don't, you know, you don't get attention, and you're used to getting attention. And if you if you uh, not being served, and you're not serving, but you want to be served, and you know, like the entitlement generation where they want to have what somebody's worth 40 years for, they want to have it the fir in their first week. Um, that the, the corporations call it the entitlement generation. This, Jesus said, you got to go through the same thing that he went through. You have to go through the same door. There's only one door, and you got to learn your manual. You got to own it. 
You got to fly the airplane. You got to fly your life. You got to you got to get involved in the process. You got to find yourself on the right side of everything. This is the thing that I met in Jesus and that I encountered with him is that he was trying to win me over, but he needed me to agree with him or he couldn't, he couldn't have me walk on the water. I was going to be a swimmer. I was supposed to be walking on the water. Now, if you want to be a swimmer, just get wet all the time and just carry extra towels with you. But that's what happens. You have your medic kit and you're just waiting for the next thing, the bad thing to happen. What if you wake up and you tell the devil, this is what's going to happen next? What if you start saying, this is what's going to happen today? And you start to have a command about you. The demons will back off if they sense, if there's like a vibration coming out of you and there's like this, 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 pulse, this pulse coming out of you, they can, it hits them and they feel that, they're going to back off. I have been healed. I have been healed, and I didn't even believe. I've been blessed financially without even giving. I told the Lord I didn't want to do this, and he said, you're perfect for the job. You're hired. <laughs> I didn't want to do this, and he said, you're perfect. I have been healed without believing. I didn't give. I didn't have somebody lay hands on me. I didn't sit under somebody. I got healed because, and I got healed with something I don't even believe in. An angel actually walked in in front of my wife and me in bed reading the Bible. We were just reading the Bible in bed. Walked up and touched me and I was completely healed completely healed to where I couldn't feel my body for a while after that. I didn't even feel the bed. And I don't even believe in that. I don't believe that angels can heal. I didn't. It didn't fit in with my theology, so my faith wasn't there, and I was actually working against it. So how do you explain that? How do you explain that I didn't even want an airplane? I didn't believe for one. I never gave towards one, never prayed for one. So could it possibly be that our breakthrough to overthrow is the fact that we just really don't understand how it works? Could it be so simple that your children will have to teach you, that they will have to bring you back to simplicity? See, I always have kids pray for me. When I got, first got saved, I have my little sister pray for me. I got her saved, and I, all my brothers and sisters saved. Got them all saved. Got my mom and dad saved. And then I had them pray for me. Because I knew, man, I'm going to get that. Those kids praying for me. Okay, so now you can feel, as we're, as we're going to close, you can feel the shift also. That see, now your angels are coming, you can, I can feel it in the room. A your angels are assigned to you. They were kind of upset with you, but now they're not. They're, they've coming, they're coming back. You can feel them. You see, what happens is people can't understand, like, well, why is there demons allowed to be around me, and why can't I feel my angels? You know, and why is it that when you ask people what's going on in your life, they have, they have the, like, the top 10 list of everything that the devil's doing, yeah. but they don't have an angel story. Yeah. What happened to Jesus when he was tested in the de desert? He was tempted of the devil for, for those, those 40 days. What does it say afterwards? The Son of God. What happened to the Son of God after he was tested and tempted in the desert? It says that angels came and ministered to him. Okay, so if he needed angel ministry, then I think you need, I think you need the platinum package. You know, like maybe two or three a day, you know. So this is the thing that this is the thing that I have against. This is the thing that I have against what's going on now. What I'm finding is is that people are standing up against the supernatural, and they're saying, you know, all this angel visitation. It's like, well, then what about all this devil visitation? It's like if you ask people, like they'll say, well, the devil told me this, 
And, they, and he did this to me. I mean, I, any one of you, if I sit down with you, you could tell me, like, this is what I'm going through right now. And it's just a way to break the ice. I, I understand that. But I'm like, well, let's get to what God's saying. Oh, he doesn't talk to me. I go, you just told me what the devil said to you. What's God doing in your life? Nothing. I'm like in a stance. But you just told me what the devil's doing. No, this is 90% or more of the body of Christ right now. This is the problem I'm having after seven years of sowing the word and, and Kathy and I exhausting ourselves and our staff to, to give out so that you could be built up. And what I'm having a problem with is that the transfer should be so that not just Warrior Note students, all there's 37,000 students and hundreds of thousands of people that follow us, what about all those others that say the Holy Spirit isn't doing these things anymore? There's no more miracles, no more tongues. Well, if you take that away, what do we have left? Because he's the only one we really have now on the earth. I mean, Jesus is seated with the Father. I mean, if you believe the Bible. And the Holy Spirit has been sent. And, and Jesus said, don't speak against him because it's not forgivable in this life or the next. You can speak against my Father, you can speak against me, but don't speak against the Spirit. Okay, so they're speaking against him. So I'm having a problem with the fact that God has done so much for us and he's so willing to break through, but he's willing to put us in overthrow to where we rule and reign and that we pray and we change things. We see response. So I expect a response. I, res I expect transformation. It has to happen because if the supernatural power of God that's in us, the one, you know, the power that rose Jesus from the dead that Paul said is dwelling in us, it says that it will quicken your body, your mortal body, which is your dying body. It'll quicken it. Well, that's, that's the clampers. That's not 110 or 220. That's 440. That's like, you're going to live and you're going to like it. You might have a little brain damage. No, you know, but when are we going to discern that when the supernatural resurrection power of God that rose Jesus from the dead that is dwelling in us now, when are we going to realize that there has to be a manifestation in our life physically? Because that has to come out. Those two collide. When your flesh and the natural come together with the, the supernatural power of God, I mean, what happened to Jesus' body? It, it lit up and lived. Okay, that power came from, from the Holy Spirit and from the Father. He had completely handed himself over to the Father, submitted to the cross, submitted to the belly of the earth, and then was rose from the dead and then was seated all by the power of God. He had given himself, his will over to the Father. He said, we are to have this mind that was in Christ, that we are not to consider ourselves as anything. Jesus didn't consider himself deity. He said he considered himself a servant. He laid aside his deity to become a servant. That's what it says. It says, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, so if that supernatural power comes in contact with your addiction, I mean, something's going to have to give. But I guarantee you, the addiction will go. The demons will go. The rejection will go. The idolatry it will go. You won't bow to an addiction. You'll, you'll say, no, I'm royalty. I don't need that. Yes. You'll tell the devil, you smoke your own pipe. Yes. <laughs> now, this is what's so weird is, is these people, I mean, think about it. They'll say, they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll take weed or anything from anybody and smoke it, but they want an organic salad. <laughs> is this organic? Is that pesticide? They don't ask, like, where the weed came from. <laughs> when they buy drugs, when, they, when you go and you get addicted to something, I mean, you ask him what's, where it comes from, the source of it. But you won't eat lettuce unless it's, like, you know, grown in the, in the Garden of Eden, you know? <laughs> uh, now, think about it. We, this, is the, this is the disconnect that we all have to address, Right? Okay. So when things start to break into this realm, when all these things that are behind the scenes that, that uh, you know, you're not sure about this or that, 
when it starts becoming visible, when the signs start happening in the heavenlies, and you start to find out that you've been lied to, and that there's this great deception coming, that it's no longer a conspiracy theory. It's planned, and it's been planned for a long time. When all this unfolds, then what's going to really happen to you is, is you're going to have to determine if what you believe is worth dying for. And if you can determine it's worth dying for, you will live, yeah. and they won't be able to kill you. Yes, Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Somebody needs to preach like this. Because, you know, it doesn't have to get worse. I mean, it should get worse for the devil. So he should have a Christian problem. We shouldn't have a devil problem. He should have a Christian problem. So just as an example, you should say, listen, you didn't, you didn't think you were going to bother my children. You didn't think you were going to, today you're going you're gonna to talk to my, my children, right? You, you, you realize that would be really bad for you because um, I'm going to make you feel pain. I'm going to lay the pain down on you. If you even talk to my mom, if you even touch my, my family, if you even touch my car or my business, you, you have to be proactive. You have to just demonstrate that you're not going from breakthrough to breakthrough. You're going into overthrow, which is dominion, which means that the devils, if they're involved, they cannot be involved anymore. And I'm telling you, it'll heal a lot of your enemies once they don't have the, the puppet master behind them. Do you get it? That's why Paul said, don't, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. You see, the body of Christ is supposed to be taking care of things at a very high level spiritually and cutting off the supply so that these demons can't look into their crystal balls. They can't, they can't discern, determine the position of the stars. Um, they, they, they get confused. They can't operate. They cannot project. They cannot visit you. They cannot influence you. They cannot talk to our leaders anymore. They, they, you think they can't walk now. You think they can't talk now. What happens when the demonic is separated from a human being? The human being is still made in the image of God. You got to remember that human beings are still in the image of God, but we're fallen. But the redemption comes in your spirit first by the born again experience. So when you, you cut off the demonic, behavior starts to change. Amen. So, you know, sometimes the veggie tails will help you more. Just say no to the bunny. Don't be the pirates that don't do anything. What do you do? Oh, we don't do anything. We just eat snacks and we sail around. The veggie tales make more sense sometimes than some of the stuff I hear. Amen. Amen. Give me a minute. I know, yeah, it's early somewhere. It's like midnight where I live. You know. The Lord, the Lord is just saying in my heart to say to you that He really loves you. And that he has plans and, and he has a way for you to escape out of anything you're in right now. He has a way out. And the Lord is saying to, to me to tell you, which you already know this, you know, I could be a nonprofit and say this, you know, but he wants to take your hand and he wants to walk you out step by step. And this has been the problem is we want it all fixed in 24 hours, but you messed it up for years and you're expecting God to fix it in 24 hours. And that's what he's saying to me is thanks a lot. You know, you've, you've been working hard against me for seven years with this and now you want to be out of debt. You know, this has happened day by day, uh, credit card transaction by credit card transaction. And it's the same thing with everything else. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story because this will be my prayer for you. It's a story. 
is I remember when I was in Bible school, I was in my, my third year of my bachelor degree. And I remember I was at a friend's house and they were, uh, they were friends and, and then they, they might even be watching now. Um, There's a married couple. And I just would hang out with them. I stayed, they didn't even have a bed for me. I slept on the floor, a tile floor with just a, like a comforter. And I remember it was so uncomfortable, but I didn't, you know, I, I just wanted to stay with them. And um, I remember praying and falling asleep. And um, like what, what happened to me all the time, all the time, I'd either like have somebody kick my foot and say, Kevin, and I'd wake up, there'd be nobody there. I'd hear my name being called. I, I'd, I'd, I'd be touched. And it was an angel telling me it's time to get up and pray. And I, I, was just, I was just too young to know. So I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I was at the worst, it was the worst time in my life. That's why I stayed overnight with them. Are you ready for this? Yes. Yes, I was sir. suicidal. Oh. I wanted, I, I, I had demons coming after me. I'd only been born again Christian for three years and I had thoughts of suicide and I didn't know why. I would fast and pray, and I would have, I had Jesus appear to me, I had angels appear to me, and all of a sudden I want to I, I want to end it all, and I don't know why. I'm telling you this because you need to hear this. I said, Lord, I, I need your help. I need you to come to me tonight, and I that's why I didn't want to be alone. And I woke up to an angel kicking me and said, pray. And I fell asleep. I rolled over and fell asleep. And you know to this day that's, that doesn't happen anymore. What would, I, if I look back, you should have seen what I went through after that. I, and the Lord, when he appeared to me later, he said, if you would have got up and prayed, you wouldn't have went through the last three years. That's what he told me. He said, I tried to stop it. The demons were ganging up on you because they knew you were about to break out into dominion. So what I started doing was, after that, I realized what had happened, and I started like reading scriptures on authority of the believer, and I started concentrating on that. And I started to build myself up in that area. And I, so what I'm telling you is, you need to know, because ministers are going through it. And ministers are coming against ministers. And people are fighting each other. It's so competitive. We're supposed to be all doing this together. And so right now, ministers are, are going through things that you wouldn't even believe. Things are happening. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to let you know. But the, what happens is you look at them as being men and women of God, and they're going through the same things that everybody else is. Because you know why? Because they're sheep, too. You know, and I used to be around ministers. They would call the people stupid sheep. I'm like, I'm done with you because you're a sheep. They weren't talking like a leader. I had people I was around to say, they says you're, the people are just money, dollar bills with legs. I'm like, you're gone. Okay, now what would cause a person to be like that? They don't discern their value and they don't discern others' value. This is infiltrated ministry and the body of Christ. And everybody's afraid to say something because of the cartel, the Christian cartel. They'll just isolate you. Well, I, I'm fine. Jesus got me here without any help. I'm not, I didn't pay to play. So I don't owe anything to anybody. Jesus did this. Jesus will do this for you. Okay, so if you are experiencing this, if you're feeling this way, the reason why you feel suicidal is because you're marked by God and the demons know it. So what if I would have ended it all back then? What about us? You'd have Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> or you'd have Ryan or anybody. You'd have Somebody would have come up, but... Look what I would have missed out on. I got tired of people prophesying over me saying I was going to have a small ministry. 
I'm like, well, what does that have to do with, with anything anyway? I've had, people, I've had people come to me that said that they were prophesied they were going to get a jet when they arrived in ministry. They were going to get a jet. I'm like, what does that have to do with arriving in ministry? You know, there are people in jail like Paul for preaching the gospel. So what happened to his jet? What happened to his bicycle? What, what happened? He didn't even have a camel. He, he, didn't, he asked for his coat and no one would bring it to him. Actually, the church that was really close didn't bring it to him. He had to get his, his uh, whoever it was, uh, whoever it was uh, that he mentioned to come bring his parchments and his jacket. But if you look, somebody could have brought him a cloak from the, the, a nearby church that he, that, that he knew, but they didn't even help him. They didn't visit him. Okay, so will you be honest with me and, and, and really look at this. Did any of the apostles experience what we experience today as far as prosperity and all this? This is part of the fact that a whole country initially gave themselves, the Mayflower Compact is 31 people on a, a little boat that gave this country to God. And, and everything that was, that was written was for the people by the people. What I noticed is, is that if you don't take dominion and walk in overthrow, that someone else will. Someone takes your spot. If you don't occupy it, someone else will. But you're going to be a slave to that person because it's your slot. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Someone else will take your, your everything. And that is what we've allowed to happen. So now we all have to agree. So let's stand because the angels are here and the spirit of God is willing. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing and Chick-fil-A is officially closed <laughs> for tonight. Yeah, well, you got a couple minutes. You got a couple minutes. Send your husband to the car, get it started. You pray for him. Would, no. We've got to agree is touching some things. But that touch is a real punch to me. Is the righteous need to stand up and be counted. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Okay, does, does it take a lot of training to become a leader? No, it just takes someone who discerns the opportunity like David did. David went to deliver his, the meals to the war, the war zone, to the line. And while he was there, he discerned that it was his time. And what the armies and everyone that was, the system that was set up wouldn't do, he did with one swing. Because he said, how dare you come against the armies of God, profane the armies of the living God. He said, I'm going to feed you to the birds today. <laughs> you know, he's got a happy meal under his arm. Given, he hadn't given one of his brothers a happy meal yet. And he comes at that giant. He, he went running at the giant. And that is what we're going to agree on tonight. I feel rising up in me. You need to take that sword that's on display in your living room and put it, put it to use. I mean, you got six Bibles in your house. You only need one of them. Just put one in your tongue and use it. And let's change the, the way things are down here and allow God to correct them. The angels are here. The Holy Spirit's here. It's flipped. I can feel it in the room. This is great for Friday night. This is really a good sign. Let's, let's agree. Are you ready for a spirit of boldness? Uh, they, 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 pray, they pray for boldness. In Book of Acts, they got, they got beat up, arrested, and they went and met, and they, what did they pray? Boldness. And they went right back out and preached Jesus again. Father, in the name of Jesus, say it. Father, in the name of Jesus. 
We ask for boldness. We ask for boldness. To preach your good news. To preach your good news. And to heal the sick. And to heal the sick. And to drive out devils. To drive out devils. To proclaim forgiveness of sins. To proclaim forgiveness of sins. The year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee. And to raise the dead. Father, we also ask for wisdom. Father, we also ask for wisdom. Because James says we will get it. So we thank you for boldness. And for wisdom. And for wisdom. Now say this, devil. Devil. I know you hear me. I know you hear me. And you know we're done. And you know we're done. So you just take your idols. You take your addictions, take take that lion tongue of yours, and you ride out of town. In Jesus' name. I mean, the Lord says this all the time. I'm saying it right now. He's saying this. It's not over until I say it's over. That's what he's saying. It's not over until I say it's over. Until that angel, that no-name angel, puts one foot on the water and one foot on the land, and he raises his hand and swears by him who lives forever, he says, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. Until that happens, until that happens, we are going to stay faithful. There's fire in this place. (laughs) The Lord says, I'm more than enough. He says, I'm too much. The Lord God says, I'm too much. You can't handle me. I wrote stuff about you and you weren't even thought of because I thought of you. When I hung on the cross, I was thinking about you. I knew you'd be living today. I knew that you'd need healing, that you'd need a miracle, that you'd need help. And so I hung on that cross for you. I had it all wrapped up before you were born. You're mine. You're fully accepted in the beloved. And my blood was enough, says the Lord. And the Lord, the Lord says, I came down and walked with you. Now you come up and sit with me. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, Paul said. Oh, oh. Yeah, we're going to do this together, aren't we, Lord? And we're going to do it together. It's one body, one voice. I got one minute left. Well... All of us here at Warrior Notes, we, we, we aren't playing, are we? No. We're totally committed. Amen. All right, tomorrow morning, I'm going to come and do coffee talk. I've been known to talk about Bigfoot and UFOs and things like that. Been known to talk about things nobody wants to talk about. We're going to have coffee talk. Coffee regular. So be here at 9, um, come help us get the food bags ready, and then please take some and distribute them, pray over them, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 9. Anything else? Apparently we can't actually have coffee in here. Okay, so we're going to have coffee talk without coffee. So are we allowed to have water in here? Yeah. Water. 
Okay, coffee, water. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yes. So, we're going to obey the, the rules. Amen. Okay, we'll see you. Kathy, do you have something you want to say? Do you have something? Kathy has something. Kathy has something. I just felt like there might, just, uh, I felt like there might be somebody in here that um, you feel like you want help, but you feel like you have to get perfect before you can ask for help. Or you need that separation from an addiction, but you feel like you have to just get things so before you can ask the Lord for help. So that's not true. All we have to do is ask for help, and then he'll help you. Okay? So, um, and it might be somebody online, but I feel like we need to give that opportunity just to ask for help, just to give the Lord permission to come in and do for us what we can't do ourselves. So let's just pray that together, okay? Father, we just, um, I'm just going to, Father, I just pray for anybody in the sound of my voice that they're the one, they need that help, and they um, they can't help themselves, Lord, which is really all of us. And um, so we just pray that you would help them right now, Lord, that you would come to their aid in that difficult situation, Lord, that you would come to the aid in every difficult situation. And um, let's just all just say that. Let's just say, Lord, help me. I receive your help. And I receive your love. Hallelujah. And let's just pray in the spirit a little bit. Shalakura mama sekiri anondo gorra babase. Eravura vura babase de este. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Just tell the Lord you love him. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We give you the glory for everything you've done and are doing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all. All right, we'll see you at 8.30 for Helping Pack uh, Bags and 9 o'clock, coffee, water, water, coffee talk. Bless you guys.